Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you again to our this gathering called the College of Complexes. Yours truly forgot the microphone from last week, so we're going to have to do a little shouting this week. We'll just uh, simply say a moment, uh, I'm getting a little bit up there in here, so we'll just call it a momentary lapse of uh, reason for senior judgment. So, uh, if you can forgive me, our speaker says he doesn't need one, so uh, we're going to do a little bit of shouting tonight. And I think we're all capable of, of doing that just fine. So, our college starts off with three basic formats. We have a brief announcements period with our speaker speaking. After that, we have the infamous question and answer period where you ask questions and not answers. And then we have our infamous rebuttal period where you'll give a chance to spout off for up to six minutes, depending on how many want to go. Welcome so tonight's moderator, Brom. Hi. Good morning, Brom. Well, tonight I have the privilege of uh, introducing David Ramsey Clark, who has spoken here before. Yes. But uh, he is the author of uh, what was it uh, from Marx's thesis, and. Uh, Stuff on good and bad and psychiatry. Uh, and atheism explained. What? And atheism explained. Ah, yes. Atheism explained. Are these good atheism explained? There are other atheism explained. Yes. Uh, if they can get together, they might have a split. You never know. They're as bad as these Christians, huh? Yeah. Anyway, you're here to hear him, not me. And since we've already had our announcements, I think we should continue with David Ramsey Clark. The name is Steele. I'm a man of Steele. Uh, good evening. Okay. Um, I've written this book uh, with a couple of uh, psychotherapists called Therapy Breakthrough. When I agreed to do this talk, I thought the book would be out by now, but best laid plans of mice and men, gang after glee. Uh, and um, it's not out yet, but it'll be out in a couple of months. Can you hear me? No. No. Okay, I'll try shouting, but that might mean... That might mean I, I falter at some point. Okay, psychotherapy has a big place in modern life. Uh, it's familiar to millions of people. Uh, something like 10% of the population have been in, in therapy in the last few years. Something like 50% of the population will be in therapy at some time during their lives. And psychotherapy appears in many places that the general public may not recognize. Uh, for example, whenever there is talk about a drug problem, you hear about addiction treatment. Well, addiction treatment in this country now is more than 99% psychotherapy and nothing but psychotherapy. Uh, marriage counseling is a good idea if you're trying to save your marriage or wreck it. Uh, and marriage counseling is usually psychotherapy. In fact, uh, anything called counseling, unless it's financial counseling or career counseling, is probably going to be psychotherapy or diluted psychotherapy. How am I doing for volume? Can you hear me? Um, psychotherapy in this culture is overtaking religion. Uh, most people would sooner go to a therapist to discuss their intimate problems than go to a minister of religion. But if they do go to their local minister of religion, they'll probably find out either that he has taken a course in psychotherapy or that he will recommend them to a Christian therapist. And the Christian therapist will be pretty much like a non-Christian therapist with a few biblical quotations thrown in. Now, not only that, but, as anybody can tell, uh, religion is becoming itself more like psychotherapy every day. If you uh, turn on your TV and watch the Reverend Joel Austin, and I'm a big fan, um, 
uh, it is pure psychotherapy. I don't mean that I agree with all of it, um, and I don't mean that it's possible to do psychotherapy to a mass audience, it isn't, but the content of what Reverend Osteen preaches is pure psychotherapy. Um, he's got the biggest congregation in the country, and the second biggest is Purpose Driven Life. What's the guy's name? Rick Warren. Rick Warren. Yeah. And that's not quite so heavily psychotherapy, but it's still 75% psychotherapy. Um, <clears throat> now, there are many different brands or schools or types of psychotherapy, and most of the public is quite unaware of this. They don't understand that there are hundreds of different types of psychotherapy. <laughs> In 1981, Raymond Corsini listed 241. Uh, about 10 years ago, a magazine for the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, listed nearly 400 that were available in the Bay Area at that time. And in other words, not counting all the hundreds that are available in New York City, but not in provincial backwaters like the Bay Area. So, uh, I reckon there are more than a thousand types of psychotherapy. I can't prove it, but it's somewhere up around there. <laughs> now, you might think, oh, there are all these different kinds of psychotherapy, but they're all pretty much the same. Well, that's not true. They're utterly different. They will tell you, give you utterly different advice, or they will refuse to give you any advice, which is a common view among many psychotherapists. Uh, for example, if you feel angry, some psychotherapists will tell you to vent your anger, let it out because it's unhealthy, to keep it bottled up. And others will tell you ways to control your anger. So that's a big difference. Uh, some psychotherapists will say, tell you there is no such thing as willpower. Other psychotherapists will give you exercises to build up your willpower. Uh, some psychotherapists will be very interested in your dreams. Other psychotherapists will not show the slightest interest in your dreams, even if you keep badgering them with accounts of your dreams. Some psychotherapists conduct sessions that are very rambly and undirected, uh, and in which nothing much happens. Uh, other psychotherapists, it's very tightly controlled and very uh, scheduled. Some psychotherapists give you homework to do when you before you come back for the next session, and others don't, have never heard of this. Some psychotherapists encourage you to read all you can about psychotherapy, whereas other psychotherapists try to discourage that, and yet other psychotherapists don't care. So, psychotherapy is not like accountancy, where you pass exams and there's a, an agreed body of knowledge that all accountants, if they're competent, share. Psychotherapy isn't like that. It's not like law. It's more like religion. Uh, and in fact, there are many parallels between psychotherapy and religion. There are in this country over a thousand religious denominations, organized churches or mosques or other kind of temples or other kind of uh, <coughs> religious fellowships. And, and a few dozen of those are quite big, 20 or 30 or 40 of those are quite big, but many of them are tiny. And psychotherapy is like that. And all the different kinds of psychotherapy, some of them are major types, none of them has anything like a majority. Uh, and many of them are quite tiny and they have a, they have a small following. And if, you, if you're interested in psychotherapy, and you, you Google different things to try and find out what's going on, you'll keep finding new psychotherapies you've never heard of before. I mean, only about a month ago, I heard about this psych, form of psychotherapy called Bipolar Advantage. It's, it's uh, based on the theory that, that bipolar is not a disorder, it's the way human beings ought to be. And, it, um, and it's, it's experiencing emotions to the fullest, and everybody who's not bipolar has got a problem. Uh, but anyway, uh, some, psycho some psychotherapists have ideas that I don't agree with, uh, but there are plenty of them out there, and they keep on forming, proliferating, mushrooming. Uh, <clears throat> now, 
One of, the, one of the other things, apart from the great diversity of psychotherapy, is there's a big contrast between real life psychotherapy and the way it's shown in the movies and TV shows. So there's a huge contrast. Um, basically, what you see if, if a psychotherapy session comes into a movie or a TV show, it's nearly always psychotherapy as it was 60 or 70 years ago. Nearly always. Uh, the, therapist is fascinated. the therapist asks about dreams, there's free association, there's a lot of attention paid, paid to childhood and relations with parents, and it always comes back to wanting to kill your father or something like that. That is psychotherapy as you see it on TV shows and on, on the movies. But movies like Prince of Ta uh, Tide, um, TV shows like Dexter. Uh, now that psychotherapy does exist in the real world, but it's now a minority of therapy in the real world. Um, and why is that? Why is it that uh, psychotherapy as portrayed in popular culture is portrayed so misleadingly and inaccurately? Well, I, I've got a theory. And I'm going to tell it to you because I'm the opinionated kind of person who likes to tell people my theories. My theory is that people who write scripts for TV shows and movies are not a random selection of the population. They're drawn from a very narrow type of within the population. Um, and they are basically literary intellectuals which is a bit of a joke because most of them are illiterate, but anyway, that's another matter. They are literary intellectuals and they have a certain ideology. And this ideology, the ideology of liter literary intellectuals, and by, by this I mean people who do subjects like a college, like modern languages, culture studies, film studies, these people, they have an ideology which thinks that Freud was a great man, they know nothing about science, and so they think he was a great scientist. Um, they think that uh, if there are things going wrong with their life, it's due to what their parents did to them when they were little. Um, and they think that they have unconscious minds that keep on creating problems for them. Now, these, this is the ideology of psychodynamic therapy, which is, a, as I'm going to demonstrate to you, a declining and a waning type of therapy, but it's the ideology, part of the ideology, of these literary intellectuals. You know, you, if you go into the psychology departments of universities, you don't find Freudians, but if you go next door to the culture studies or the literature department, they're all Freudians. And similarly, if you go into the economics department, you don't find any Marxists, but if you go to the literary studies, the culture studies and the modern languages, they're all Marxists. So, um, so we get, when we look at TV shows and movies, we get the ideology of this little group in the population whose ideas are not at all typical of the population as a whole or of people who are experts in these subjects. Um, they're very untypical. But that, so that's why on, uh, in popular culture we see psychotherapy as it was 60 or 70 years ago and not as it is today, predominantly, because there's a great variety. Now, um, if I've mentioned 60 or 70 years ago, which is an important uh, passage of time. And Susie was going to take care of it. If we go back 60 or 70 years, what do we find? Then we find that psychotherapy in the United States was very, very homogeneous. It was very, very similar. Uh, it was overwhelmingly what was called psychoanalysis or psychoanalytically uh, applied therapy. Um, it was the ideas of Sigmund Freud. Uh, or if it wasn't, it was very closely related to those ideas. It was one of the disciplines from Freud. Uh, Karen Hornei or Karl Jung or something like that. Um, that has all changed now. Uh, most psychotherapists today have no contact with anything called psychoanalysis. Most psychotherapists today are not Freudians, they're not Jungians, they're not Horneyites, they're not um, Hadlerians, uh, they're not Randians, uh, and they don't 
believe in an unconscious mind and they don't believe in the supreme importance of your dreams or of your childhood experiences. And they don't believe that everything's down to sex. Um, so, there has, so the reason the reason why 60 or 70 years ago there was one basically homogeneous type of psychotherapy, with very few exceptions, and today there are a thousand different types of psychotherapy, is basically because of the collapse of Freudianism as an ideology. Uh, <coughs> Freudianism as, sorry? Louder. You want me to be even louder? Yeah, they're having trouble in the last. back. Um, <coughs> Psychoanalysis has collapsed and fragmented, and that is what has given you the thousand different types of psychotherapy today. Now, psychoanalysis has collapsed and fragmented in different ways. People at different times over the past 60 or 70 years have fallen out with psychoanalysis for different reasons. So, in order to uh, sort of get some feel for what exactly happened, we have to go back to psychoanalysis and uh, go through this whole dreary story. In 1882, uh, a man named Sigmund Freud became a practicing doctor in Vienna, specializing in nervous disorders. Um, and he collaborated with a man called Josef Breuer. Uh, and they were very interested in what was then called hysteria. Now today we understand that hysteria is mostly a bogus disease. There is no such thing as hysteria. Uh, but in those days, nearly everybody suffered from hysteria. Well, women and poor people suffered from hysteria. Men and rich people suffered from neurasthenia. Uh, uh, and uh, if you had, if the more money you had, the more likely it would be that you'd be diagnosed with neurasthenia and the less likely that you'd be disposed, uh, diagnosed with hysteria. Uh, <clears throat> basically, doctors then as now didn't know a lot and when they couldn't diagnose something, they blamed the patient. Uh, and so that's what they always do, but they didn't know so much then. Uh, so they, people with all sorts of uh, physical problems, uh, frontal lobe epi epilepsy and things like this, would be diagnosed as hysterical. Uh, and there were different, different theories about hysteria. Uh, some of them were purely physical, but some of them uh, lay in the realm of psychology. Now, in, in, 18, in 1896, Freud believed he had made a great discovery, and he announced this discovery to the world. He wrote four articles enthusiastically promoting this discovery. And this discovery was what's called the child seduction theory. Uh, and his, his, uh, what, he had, what he claimed to have found was this, people suffering from hysteria or other neuroses, neurosis is just a fancy name for some kind of emotional or behavioral problem. Uh, all people who are hysterical or neurotic, they got that way because they had uh, a sexual experience when they were young, when they were little children. Um, later on, he changed what he said, he, he changed the theory that he said he'd given in 1896. To begin with, this was not a theory that their fathers had molested them. It was quite a different theory, but that's what it later became as he rewrote history. Now, he, Freud only accepted this theory for just over a year. He abandoned it uh, in uh, less than uh, a year and a half after he first came out with this flurry of great discovery. And he then, although he didn't admit to the world that he'd abandoned this theory for some years, and he, he came up with a new theory. And his new theory was this. It's not, when you're dealing with someone who's got a problem, an adult with a problem, walks into your office and says, I've got a problem. Uh, <coughs> It's not that they were molested or had a sexual experience when they were little. It's that they imagined they had. And why did they imagine it? Because they had this powerful wish to have sex with their mother and kill their father. Uh, and that's called, in the country I come from, the Oedipus Complex, but in this country it's called the Oedipus Complex, and I'll try to remember that. It's called the Oedipus Complex after the 
uh, legendary King Oedipus, who in fact did that, married his mother and killed his father. Not the, the other order, of course. Uh, so, so this, this was a theory that Freud came up with. And it, instead of being a theory that some people have an Oedipus complex and that gives them problems, his theory was that everybody had an Oedipus complex. Strangely enough, and a lot of people don't understand this, he thought that girls had an Oedipus complex too. But at the age of five, girls discovered that they'd been castrated. And this caused them to want to, get, to have a baby to give to their father as a replacement penis. Uh, so, uh, this, this is Freud. so basically Freud argued that little girls at the age of five stop wanting to make love with their mother and kill their father and switch over. Um, anyway. Freud also, was in these few years, at the end of the uh, 19th century, was writing a book called The Interpretation of Dreams. Uh, the Interpretation of Dreams oh, I should have told you all the was printed in 1899. Uh, it said 1900 on the title page, but it was actually printed in 1899. Uh, and Freud argued that dreams were symbolic, and it was possible to analyze dreams and show what they meant. And part of his technique for analyzing people's dreams was the technique of free association, in which he would say, just say whatever comes into your head, uh, and the patient would come out with a word, and then he'd say, well, what does that make you think of? The patient would come out with another word. And if you, t if you play that game long enough, you'll soon get to childhood sex. <laughs> uh, so that's what Freud did. Uh, and, uh, or anything else, you'll soon get to a pink monkey, uh, if you want to. Uh, but anyway, um, so Freud changed his ideas very radically at the end, very end of the 19th century. Uh, and although he'd earlier been calling it psychoanalysis, this is what psychoanalysis became. Freud also started what he called the Wednesday Society in his apartment in Vienna. And he was, because he had published this book, he had a few admirers. It was, for some years, it was only a few. But he had a little bit of fame. Uh, more fame than I've got with what I've written. Uh, there's no justice in the world. But anyway, he got a bit of fame. Uh, and this gradually grew. Uh, and he, so he had this Wednesday society. And people who were interested in these ideas would chat every Wednesday night in his apartment. Uh, gas in, in Vienna. Uh, and this is the beginning of what we can say is a kind of church of psychoanalysis. Uh, and uh, by, by around 1909, when Freud and two other psychoanalysts uh, visited the United States on a, to give some lectures, his fame was getting greater. And sales of the interpretation of dreams were increasing. Uh, <coughs> So, what happened then was that this psychoanalytic movement, this church, set up psychoanalytic associations step by step, first in Vienna, then in Berlin, then in New York, throughout the world. Uh, and these were not, these associations were not professional associations. You couldn't pass an examination and be qualified and join. But basically, they were ideological organizations. You had to agree to join. So they were like the Communist Party, or the National Socialist Party, they had, or the Catholic Church, uh, or the Presbyterian Church. These were organizations where you had to accept the beliefs. And if you started departing, then you might be expelled. So um, the practice developed. Now, me meanwhile, uh, Psychoanalysts were taking what they called patients and treating them, which meant sitting, lying them on a couch, sitting behind them with a pencil and a notepad, uh, and interpreting their dreams, and taking it all back to childhood sex. Uh, now, uh, that became, the, 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 the pe they, people paid big hourly rates for this, and you were expected to be, you were expected if you were taking full psychoanalysis to uh, at least three times a week, sometimes five times a week, uh, for, for se usually for several years. So this, this is not being marketed, the target market here is not the proletariat. Right? 
uh, the target market is people who've got a lot of money and a lot of time on their hands. Uh, and um, so this was this was a lucrative business, and part of part of the appeal for someone who joined a, do a young doctor who came into Freud's circle. Uh, part of the appeal of being orthodox and, and agreeing with Freud was that you were part of this network where patients would be referred to you and you'd get a good income. Uh, and whereas if you, um, if you were rejected by Freud and his circles, uh, then you know, you, you'd, you'd lose these networking uh, benefits. Okay, so uh, what happened then was predictable. Uh, given, given all we know about human belief systems throughout history, uh, there were splits and dissensions uh, within the psychoanalytic movement. The first major one was the expulsion of Alfred Adler. Uh, and um, he was developing some ideas that were a bit different to Freud. Uh, he was saying that Childhood sex wasn't the only explanation of neurosis. Uh, he emphasized feelings of inferiority and invented the term inferiority complex. Um, and uh, he was kicked out by Freud uh, from the psychoanalytic movement. He was expelled and various people went with him and became followers and they became Adlerians and they renamed their kind of, they called, instead of calling themselves psychoanalysts, they, called their movement Individual Psychology, and it's still around today. There's a big building on State uh, on um, Dearborn Street. Uh, I haven't been inside it and seen what they're up to recently, but it's Individual Psychology. It's the Adlerian movement that began back in uh, around 1906 when Adler was expelled in Vienna from the psychoanalytic movement. Um, a few years later, Wilhelm Steckel was expelled, but he didn't found a separate movement. A few years later, Carl Jung was expelled. Jung was the crown prince of psychoanalysis. Uh, he was younger than Freud, as his name implies, uh, and, uh, and, um, and it was generally recognized that it, Freud wrote him letters saying, my dear son and heir, um, and uh, they were, they, they, they clicked, they hit it off, and um, like all psychoanalysts, they, had, they thought that this was homosexual. Because psychoanalysts have these fanciful ideas, and they think that if two men like each other, it must be homosexual. So that was part of their theory. Um, they got on like a house on fire for a while, but then Freud, then Jung started to come out with ideas of his own. One of the interesting things about this, if you look at these ideological movements and the way they split, it's usually the most talented people who uh, are the cause of the split. Whereas the mediocrities, who've got no place else to go, they get importance by sticking with the orthodoxy. Anyway, uh, Carl Jung uh, developed some ideas, and one of the ideas he developed was, <laughs> he slightly tidied up this, instead of saying that little girls have, a, have an Oedipus complex, that they have a homosexual crush for their mothers and want to kill their fathers until they discover they've been castrated. Sorry. Uh, he developed a much more wholesome theory uh, that they want to um, they want to do the opposite. Uh, they want to uh, kill their mothers and have sex with their fathers. Oh. So uh, that's obviously much more wholesome. <laughs> so um, so uh, young, young, it's a much and it's a much simpler simpler theory. But actually, sex declined in importance in Jung's theory. Although not in his life, he was a very active person. Uh, in many ways. But in his theories, sex declined in importance. He became very interested in folk tales, myth. Um, so the Jungian movement today is very powerful. And it's, uh, you know, if you look at um, uh, some of the writers like Ursula Le Guin or um, Richard Adams, if you look at uh, the Star Wars movie, uh, George Lucas, these are tremendous influence of Jungian ideas in popular culture. Um, but anyway, uh, Jung was. Jung was booted out of the psychoanalytic movement. Um, and um, when these people were booted out, they were diagnosed as mentally ill. They were all, they were all, when, whenever, whenever someone fell out with Freud, uh, because he didn't agree with everything Freud said, and then he was booted out, uh, 
part of the explanation for why this had happened was that that person was psychotic. Um, and, and generally speaking, uh, Freud's loyal soldiers made up stories about the one they booted out to show that they were psychotic. Uh, the, the particularly loyal, so, loyal soldier was a Welshman by the name of Ernest Jones, who kept on writing stuff uh, in support of Freud, and he always explained how everybody who disagreed with Freud was, had a dangerous psychosis. It reminds me of the fact that, you know, that Joseph Stalin, uh, all the people he was friendly with and then fell out with were always fascist spies. They weren't just mistaken, <laughs> you know, they were fascist spies and saboteurs. And all the people that Ayn Rand was friendly with and fell out with, they were all uh, totally sick and, and uh, uh, morally abysmal. They weren't just people she'd had a disagreement with, you know. And it's the same in all these ideological movements. It seems there is something in the, in the dynamics of these movements. You can't just say, okay, we disagree, go our separate ways. You have to say they are the devil. Uh, and this is what happened in the psychoanalytic movement. It's quite successful. Uh, because the psychoanalytic movement was growing all the time. It was getting plenty of money from rich clients who wanted to dive into their unconscious depths and discover themselves uh, by remembering what had happened to them or what they fantasized when they were four years old. Um, and, um, and it was catching on like wildfire in the United States. You know, the United States is as amber waves of well-to-do neurotics. And these, uh, these people from the German-speaking world rushed over here to make money out of these, uh, out of these poor saps uh, by psychoanalyzing them. Anyway, <coughs> uh, you see, I do, have, I, do, I do have opinions about some of these things. I'm not just, I'm not just soberly recounting the facts, but I hope I'm doing that as well. <laughs> now, <coughs> um, Freud and his, his little group set up a secret committee. There were six members, uh, they, uh, and they ruled they were completely secret. No one knew about them in the outside world, but Freud gave them each a ring with a special insignia. Uh, and they were the ones who would monitor everything that was going on. And if they saw any deviancy, they'd get, they'd get ready to expel that person. And so uh, they were the guardians of orthodoxy. Now, as always happens, who can say what happens to that secret committee? Two out of the six were eventually expelled. <laughs> uh, Otto Rank was expelled. And Sandor Ferenczi, one of the leading psychoanalysts, was yapping at his heels. What a, what a psychotic horror horror is Otto Rank. And then Sandor Ferenczi was expelled. Uh, so um, these were all people who Otto Rank went, went around, uh, still did analysis, and he actually charged more per hour than Freud. Um, and I quite like, I don't like psychoanalysis at all, but I quite like Otto Rank. Uh, I think he was much more lovable than any of these others. Uh, and one of the, one of the things that about all these psychoanalysts, they all, except Otto Rank, they all despised the United States. <laughs> Whereas Otto Rank loved the United States and he personally identified with Huckleberry Finn. He, to, he came from a very poor Jewish ghetto background in Eastern Europe uh, and uh, changed his name from Rosenthal to Rank and made himself as a, uh, as a new figure. Uh, and, he and he identified with Huckleberry Finn, this, this dirty, uh, disheveled person who was uh, setting up a raft down the Mississippi. Anyway, but uh, his theories were all wrong, of course, but that's another matter. Uh, but he was a lovable character. Wilhelm Reich was a sexual revolutionary, um, and he was, uh, a, he was a close friend of Freud. Now, when, when psychoanalysis, well, he was a close friend of Freud to begin with, uh, when psychoanalysis got going, Part of becoming a psychoanalyst was you had to be psychoanalyzed yourself. This was like a reap de passage. You had to go through for a couple of years. You had to unburden all your private intimate thoughts to a psychoanalyst. You had to discover, as if by shock, shock and horror, uh, you weren't expecting this, that you wanted to make love with your mother and kill your father. Um, uh, and then this would come out and, uh, this, and the, the analysis would eventually um, arrive at the only successful form that a psychoanalysis can arrive at, which is that the patient comes to agree with the guesses of the analyst. There is no other successful analysis than that. Um, so, Wilhelm <clears throat> um, Reich uh, was never analyzed. <laughs> Freud just liked him, so he said, hey, you're a psychoanalyst. Um, and for a while, 
Reich was a very orthodox Freudian, but he was also interested in promoting social revolution. Uh, and he tried to he kept, he kept trying to get the Communist Party in Germany was his, interested in his sexual revolutionary ideas. And they didn't like this at all. Because I don't know if you know much about uh, 1930s communism, but it's quite puritanical. You know, it's um, it's there's quite macho in fact. Uh, so uh, he didn't get on well with the Communist Party, uh, and eventually he had nothing but contempt for them. He decided he, uh, they weren't good enough for him, but he remained uh, a social socialist revolutionary uh, in his in his mind. He didn't join any socialist revolutionary <laughs> movement, but he remained a socialist revolutionary. Uh, but however, more important than that, his ideas on therapy evolved, uh, <clears throat> and on much else. Uh, Wilhelm Reich. Uh, believe that the problem with most people was that they didn't have good enough orgasms. Right. Uh, and the, the reason that they didn't have good enough orgasms is because their muscles were too uh, cramped or too tightly controlled. And that what you had to do was to break down this muscular defense, this character armor as he called it, and then they'd have good orgasms and they'd be cured of whatever was troubling them. And part of the therapy was, uh, was the um, was the therapist massaging the body of the partly unclothed uh, patient. So it, Reich achieved a certain notoriety. He came to the United States and then he started making some wonderful discoveries. He discovered that the whole universe was suffused by something called orgone energy, which you could see in the aurora borealis, um, and which was the energy behind orgasms. Um, and um, uh, he, he made these boxes. It's called orgone energy accumulators. Huh. And um, he actually he, he wrote to everybody trying to explain to them that these, he'd scientifically proved that these boxes could accumulate orgone energy. And among the people he wrote to was Albert Einstein. If you know much about Albert Einstein, you know that he was a sucker for quack. Uh, alternative medicines. In fact, he believed in the Bates method of improving your eyes without glasses, which is why whenever you see pictures of Einstein, he's always squinting because he can't see anything. Uh, but anyway, uh, he got interested in Wilhelm Reich and uh, Reich started writing to him, and he said to him, look, you can prove that there is organ energy in these organ, uh, organ energy accumulators because the temperature is higher inside than it is outside. See, they, he, they made these boxes, and there was a layer of metal, a layer of wood. Uh, and they, you could go inside them and sit in there for half an hour a day, and it was supposed to do something for your, for your orgasms. But anyway, uh, so Einstein took a look at this, and he decided that the higher temperature inside these boxes was due to, was an indirect, an indirect outcome of temperature gradient. Temperature gradient, in any room, it's always coldest near the floor and warmest near the ceiling. And an indirect effect of this, according to Einstein, was why inside the organ and the energy boxes, it was a bit warmer. So he wrote and told Reich this, and Reich started writing immensely long letters to Einstein, explaining that he got it wrong, and that it really was organ energy, and it was being accumulated in these boxes. And then Einstein stopped answering Reich's, um, Reich's letters which proved that he was in on the conspiracy. Anyway, um, uh, Reich also decided that he could create weather. He had developed a cloud buster where he would fire up because the reason that you had droughts and the reason the farmers were getting poor because they didn't have any rain was because all going energy was being blocked. So he, he started, he started building these cloud busters to fire at the sky to release the organ energy so it would rain. And he got farmers to pay him for this. Um, and anyway, uh, the, the US Food and Drug Administration got on to Reich, and they, uh, they decided he was doing something fraudulent, selling, selling these organ energy accumulators, and they, and they, they gave him a, a, a court injunction that he must not send any of these across state lines. And he just ignored it. Uh, so he was put, sent, sent to prison, um, yeah. and he died in prison. Um, and <coughs> if you want proof that the US government is even crazier than Wilhelm Reich, they then made a bonfire of 60 tons of his writings. 
uh, because they, they were all fraudulent because they were all trying to get people to buy these uh, orgone acc accumulators. So that's Bill, Bill Helm Wright. Um, a much more serious figure in the history of psychoanalysis, a kind of pivotal figure who prefigures what is to come, is Karen Horner. Um, I, in my original draft for this chapter in the book, I said the, ba the baser elements of our readership will be disappointed to, to learn that the name is pronounced Horner. But my co-author said I had to take that out. It was too, uh, it was too uh, off-color a joke. I don't think it is. Uh, anyway, Karen Horner uh, is a remarkable person in the history of psychoanalysis. Um, <clears throat> She was born Karen Danielson in Hamburg, or just outside Hamburg. She came to the United States, a divorced woman with two daughters, and she became a major figure in psychoanalysis. But she started developing her own ideas, uh, and that's always risky. Uh, and so one of the ideas the psychoanalysts had at this time was the idea of penis envy. Uh, that, and that is what motivates women. Women are envious of men. They feel right. inferior because they have discovered at the age of four or five that they've been castrated. They don't have a penis. Therefore, this makes them envious. Well, Karen Horn I was a bit skeptical about penis envy, thus showing what? Thus showing her resistance, unconscious resistance to this idea, and thus proving that penis envy was true. Anyway, uh, but she, she turned the tables and she said that men suffer from womb envy. Um, I think, Right here. Oh, oh, I've got my coffee. There's fresh water here. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, I mean, I think that uh, womb envy is just as hilarious as penis envy. And it's amazing that someone as intelligent as Karen Horn, I could take it all of this seriously. But this was a, this was a major battle in the 1930s. And eventually, uh, not over that alone, there were many other differences. Um, Horn I broke from the, the, the official Freudian church and formed her own separate psychoanalytic association. Um, so <coughs> that was Horn I. Uh, then after, after the demise of the secret committee, the secret committee broke up when two of its members were expelled. Uh, it's a bit like the French Revolution. But the, 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 the secret committee went out and then Psychoanalysis as a movement, as an ideological movement, became slightly more liberal. It, they still expel people who, who had different views, but there was, a, there was a little more leeway. And I think that part of the reason for this is that one of the people who was experimenting with slightly different views was Freud's daughter, Anna Freud. Um, so she really marks the beginning of ego psychology. And ego psychology, by comparison with traditional psychoanalysis, is much more close to common sense. It doesn't mean it's always right, but it's much closer to common sense because it's. And the main concept of, of uh, ego psychology is that we have defense mechanisms to protect our ego. Uh, and um, one of these defense mechanisms has taken on a life of its own, and that's denial. I get sick every time I hear that because if you're denying something, you're, you have a 50% chance of being right. Um, so denial is, is uh, the idea that denial is a special state of mind is a curious idea. Uh, denial just means that the client disagrees with the therapist, that's all. And they may be right, they may be wrong. But anyway, this was ego psychology. Then the next big thing, which was started within official psychoanalysis, uh, but became more and more estranged from it, was object relations. And object relations, I think it's fair to say, although this isn't normally said, but I think it's fair to say is now the mainstream of psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis is, is a tiny fr uh, fraction of what it used to be, uh, but object relations uh, theory is now the mainstream. And object, the object relations theory were the people who rejected Freud, who agree, agreed with most of Freud, but they rejected his instinct theory. Uh, and instead they said, that babies, little children, have not just a selfish desire for pleasure, but they also want to form meaningful relationships. So this, this was the beginning of, of object relations. You, you can hear me now. I can stop shouting. <laughs> 
Um, so this is the object relations school. Uh, and it, it has had a major impact upon ideas uh, because the object relations people were the people who propounded the whole idea of attachment as being tremendously important. Uh, uh, and then uh, it, it led, that led in turn to the idea of bonding, of mother-child bonding as being tremendously important. Now, I don't think that either of those things are tremendously important, but I do think they are an advance on Freud's ideas. Uh, there is something that is testable there. There is something that is potentially scientific. Um, now, what recent research suggests is that people do not form their model for how they're going to relate to others on the basis of their relations with their parents when they're very young. That, that whole idea is misconceived. Uh, and that actually little babies are pre-programmed genetically to reject what their parents, uh, how they interact with their parents, and to form new patterns when they interact with peers, uh, with slightly older children, uh, and with other people later. And that, they, in fact, whereas no one has been able to demonstrate by research studies that childhood interaction with parents has any effect whatsoever upon the formation of personality, uh, they have been able to show some not a huge, but some influence from uh, uh, relationships with peers. So, <coughs> um, I've talked about Freud's psychoanalysis, and I've talked about people who dissented from this and went their own way. Now, basically, you can say there was, there was the Freudian psychoanalytic movement. There were people who were expelled and, and banished into the wilderness and went off and formed their own movements. And then there were people who tried to stay, after, after psychoanalysis got a little bit more liberal, they tried to stay within it and improvise their own ideas. Now, that doesn't, that doesn't pay, I've not said anything at that point about people who say, we're not psychoanalysts at all, we're to something totally different. Now, uh, up until about 1939, that was almost unheard of. There were no such people. Uh, there were just there just weren't. Uh, there, everybody was uh, was some kind of psychoanalyst. Everybody who was pra who was uh, practicing as a psychotherapist was some kind of a psychoanalyst. Um, and no, the, the man who changed all that was a man called Carl Rogers, who developed oh, yeah. what he called non-directive therapy or counselling or um, uh, person-centred therapy or counselling. And he is probably the most influential single psychotherapist in the history of, of psychotherapy. Uh, and he started developing these ideas. Like everybody else in, in this story, he started out as a psychoanalyst. He was uh, convinced of, uh, of, uh, of the, that Freud was right, and he, and he believed all these ideas. He came under the influence of Otto Rank, and that began to dislodge some of the ideas. Otto Rank died. Uh, quite young in 1939, uh, and Carl Rogers went on to launch his own type of therapy and never called it psychoanalysis. So here you have the first case of uh, a type of, a brand if you like, uh, or school of psychotherapy which does not claim to be psychoanalysis uh, psycho an at all, and that is what is now called Rogerian therapy. And what was this therapy? Well, uh, Client-centered means that you listen to what the client says. And a lot of what Rogers did, and this is easy to make fun of, was he listened to what the client said and repeated it back. Uh, the technique known as reflection. Uh, and uh, didn't try to offer advice or take it in any direction, but just allowed the situation, the relationship between the therapist and the client to unfold with the therapist repeating to back to the client, what the client was saying, putting it slightly more precisely and slightly more dispassionately uh, in order to enable the client to feel um, more easy about it. Uh, and part of, part of uh, Roger's uh, doctrine was that people are naturally good. It's a very American idea, I always think. Uh, that if, if they develop, if they self-actualize, if they develop their inner resources, they're going to be good people. Now, I th when I think about this, I'm not American, 
by background, and I tend to think if someone develops their own resources, they're probably going to become a serial killer. <laughs> uh, but the Americans uh, tend to go along with this idea that growth and inner development is going to lead you in a, uh, in a pre to a pre-established harmony with the world. Uh, and so this is what Rogers believed. Now, uh, it caught on tremendously among social workers and counsellors throughout the United States, and, and then throughout the world, but it's very popular. Uh, it's left its mark. Uh, I, but, of course, it, it, uh, it cries out, uh, what, what, what are you supposed to do when the therapist can see some mistake in the thinking or the, tradition, or the habitual responses for the clients? Uh, why, why is it wrong for the therapist to point this out to the client and actually advise the client on how to change the way they're thinking? Um, and this is uh, where we start to get to the real hero of the story. But before we get there, we have a, a, a couple of examples of um, <coughs> uh, things that don't really lead anywhere. One of these is what is usually called existential humanist therapy. And I'm, I'm dealing with this chronologically, ex existential humanist therapy began really in the 40s uh, and it was in the 50s and 60s it grew and then, it, uh, and then it, it, by the 70s it was huge. Um, after the second, at the time of the Second World War and after, uh, among people who were interested in psychotherapy there were three uh, important ideas. One of them was this idea of self-actualization. Um, <clears throat> another was, the, was trying to find an alternative to psychoanalysis or behaviorism. I should explain that nearly all psychotherapists were psychoanalysts. They believed in Freud. But in the universe, university psychology departments, no one was a Freudian. They were all behaviorists, followers of Ivan Pavlov, uh, who believed that it was a mistake to try to uh, understand human beings uh, by subjective states of mind or feelings. And that you should try to observe them and their responses. And, every, and they try to explain everything in terms of uh, learning. And this was, this was the dominant orthodox. So you have these two orthodoxies that were quite different side by side. Therapists were all psychoanalysts. Uh, people in the university research departments of, of, uh, of psychology uh, were behaviorists. There were also, of course, psychiatrists. A psychiatrist is a medical doctor who specializes in mental illness, uh, and they took from, they were influenced by both, and also by more traditional ideas of uh, physical wall baths and that kind of thing, you know. Um, but, um, so, people who were intellectually alive and reading a lot, and were interested in psychotherapy, were also reading some of this behaviorist stuff, and they, and, and they, what they saw was that in different ways, both psychoanalysis and behaviorism were ignoring what was human. One of them was talking about unconscious drives which we had no evidence really existing, and the other was saying that you could reduce humans to rats uh, and observe how they learn. Um, and uh, so there was, so that was the second idea. Um, and the third idea, and the third idea was existentialism, uh, which was very popular among American intellectuals at the time. It's interesting that at every point in in the past, um, I don't know, eighty or ninety years. Uh, there are ideas that develop in French philosophy, and they're taken up by Americans, by American intellectuals, usually not by American philosophers, but by these culture studies crowd, these people I don't like. Uh, uh, so now it's, uh, it's po the post is, is post-structuralism, post-modernism, all that, all that crowd. Uh, uh, stuff that isn't taken very seriously by French philosophers is taken very seriously by people who've got to write, you know, um, uh, something about um, a, psych a, a psychological study of Dexter or something like that, you know, for their for their film studies class. Uh, so, um, but it, but in the forties it was existentialism, postmodernism, all that stuff hadn't been heard of. But existentialism was the thing because Jean Paul Sartre's stuff was being published uh, after no, the war, uh, and he was very uh, charismatic figure among intellectuals. Yeah, sure. So so these three things, self-actualization, existentialism, and um, trying to find a bridge between or an alternative to psychoanalysis and behaviorism, they gave rise to this existential humanist tradition in psychotherapy. 
Now there is no there is no unified theory of existential humanism. They're all all a bit different. Uh, the most famous existential humanist therapist today is Irving Yalom, uh, whose whose biggest selling book was called Love's Executioner, uh, and he wrote. He's still alive. He wrote a number of books, um, which are just accounts of his therapy sessions with his clients. Uh, and then he started writing fiction, which some people said he was doing all along. Uh, and uh, uh, he's now written a number of novels, which have sold quite well. Uh, but he, but uh, what what these people think is that at the root of our at the root of our problems, at the root of our neuroses, is not the fact that we wanted to make love with our mother and kill our father. Uh, it's, uh, and it's not some organic imbalance in the brain. Uh, it's the fact that um, we have these four existential fears. Fear of death, fear of being alone, fear of being free to choose, and what's the other one? Um, it's, it's escaped my mind. I've repressed the memory, it's so horrible. Um, but, uh, uh, anyway, the four existential fears, or fear of meaningless, fear of meaninglessness, those are the four. Uh, so, um, in different ways, I, actually, I've, I've got this th th thought about existential humanism, but it's very odd that nobody notices that self-actualization and existentialism are completely and utterly contradictory. Because self-actualization is a kind of Aristotelian idea that there is some inner essence which should develop in a certain way, whereas existentialist philosophy, as those of, those of you who have read Sartre know, starts from the assumption that there is nothing, there is no direction to your life, it's all arbitrary, you're thrown into the world and you just have to make a choice. And, but nobody notices this, which is, to me, a sign of just how shallow they all are. Uh, but um, then another thing I should mention is gestalt therapy, because this is, this is something else that happens. Uh, and again, I would say that one of the things that strikes me about the Gestalt therapists, the most famous is Frederick Pearls, Fritz, known as Fritz Pearls, uh, is their extreme ignorance. You know, they called himself a Gestalt therapist. He knew nothing about Gestalt psychology, which is a very, very serious scientific tradition in German psychology concerned mainly with perception. Um, and he just took the word and uh, um, did what he did with it. Uh, and Gestalt therapy really developed, came into its own in the 70s, the me, the me decade. Uh, they had these workshops and it was very emotional and um, there are at least two definitely recorded instances, instances where Fritz Pearl physically assaulted a client. Um, and uh, they, they, they borrowed the ideas of Marino who had, who had developed uh, psychodrama. Uh, so they had a lot of this psychodrama, the empty chair, uh, and so on. And really, this, for those of you who remember uh, what came later, this is the precursor of Est, uh, we, that uh, Werner um, Erhardt, as he called himself, uh, uh, took this, a real a great entrepreneur, took this and ran with it to this idea of um, humiliating and upsetting people for a weekend <laughs> and then saying they'd learn something. <laughs> and uh, no doubt some of them did. Uh, but, uh, it's easy to give a couple of hundred bucks to work around. <laughs> That's mainly what they learn. Um, anyway, uh, another thing that was going on at this time was behavior therapy. And this was this is not to be confused with behaviorism, although the behavior therapists were somewhat uh, influenced by that. The big name in behavior therapy was Joseph Walby, who started out in South Africa, then moved to the United States. Uh, and he started using um, what he called um, uh, in inhibition. Basically, the idea is this. You take someone who's got a problem, uh, you, um, you make them think about the problem, but you give them something nice at the same time. And what he would do is he would, he would take the problem and he would put it into a scale of horrifying to very slightly unsettling. And he'd start at the slightly unsettling end, and he would give the patient uh, relaxation exercise so they feel good, and then acquaint them with this slightly upsetting thing. And over a period, it would cease to be upsetting at all. And then when that was accomplished, you'd move to the next, slightly more upsetting stage. And you'd continue like that until you'd cleared the whole area. 
and it was very, very successful in the treatment of phobias. Um, and it, its other forms of behavior therapy have not been so successful. The one that everybody's heard of is aversion therapy. And aversion therapy is basically, if somebody's doing something you want to stop them doing, you give them an electric shock. Um, I had a friend way back in, uh, the, in my early life who was a Glaswegian, he was from Glasgow, and therefore he was a drunk. Um, and um, uh, he, had, he did, went through every kind of treatment for being a drunk. And one of them was uh, aversion therapy. And, he, and he, he went through this aversion therapy. He, he made two comments about it. He was very, very intelligent, uh, very intelligent man. Um, one was that after every, every aversion therapy, he really felt like a drink. Um, and, and, the other, and the other was that, 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 that these sessions succeeded in giving him a very powerful aversion to electric shocks. Um, uh, um, but anyway, um, Wolpe's, Wolpe's uh, reciprocal inhibition was much more successful in aversion therapy. However, when you went from phobias, which are very specific, like someone's afraid of heights or afraid of rats, uh, uh, and you go to something like depression, it's, it's A, less successful, and B, it's hard to work out how you should be doing it at all. Because what is it that, you have to decide what it is that's depressing someone before you can, uh, and so the more you try to generalize this behavior approach, uh, which won't be, won't be recognized that, that there was a big cognitive element in what he was doing, that he, was, he had to understand the thoughts of the patient. He was not a crude Pavlovian at all. Uh, but, but the more you generalize this, uh, <clears throat> the more you have to understand that, there's a huge, that people's thoughts are important. And that is what happened to Wolpe, more and more, uh, starting from pure behave, behavior therapy, moved in the direction of addressing people's thoughts. Now we get on to the good guys. The good guys are coming now. Um, the really good guys. And the, 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 the goodest of the good guys, the best of the good guys, it was Albert Ellis. Um, and Albert Ellis uh, made a very radical departure. Um, <clears throat> Ellis is an interesting character. Uh, he, he, he wanted to be a popular writer, but he could never publish anything. Um, he spent some years as a paid organizer for a left-wing political group. Uh, he found that he really enjoyed giving people advice on their personal problems. He could, uh, and uh, this, this, and, and, the, the, to such, and they enjoyed it to such an extent they were prepared to pay him. So he decided to do a degree in clinical psychology at Columbia University. Um, and uh, he was a psychoanalyst, of course, as everybody knows. Um, <clears throat> well, by the way, one of the TV shows which can't be faulted is Mad Men because it's set in a period where psychotherapy was all psychoanalysis. You know, so that's the way it presents it. So that's perfectly accurate. The, the late 50s and early 60s, 90% uh, of therapy was psycho psychoanalytically oriented. So anyway, um, Ellis uh, got his degree, um, and uh, he tried to reform psychoanalysis uh, from within, uh, basically uh, adhering to most psychoanalytic ideas, although he was very influenced by Horner, um, and, and rather than by Freud. He was also influenced by Albert. Um, and um, he gradually came to the conclusion that what he was trying to do in psychoanalysis uh, was fundamentally flawed and that people cause problems for themselves by the way they think. Um, now, it doesn't, when, this is not a question of whether you agree with E equals MC squared. It's a question of basic gut think thoughts that people have. Uh, for instance, someone makes a mistake and they say, I always screw up. Um, <clears throat> what does that mean? It means that they have a view of the world where everything they do wrong confirms this theory that they're, that they're fated to keep screwing up. Uh, and so what Ellis called these things self-statements, uh, and he developed his famous ABC method to deal with it. And, uh, the interesting thing about this is that it doesn't talk about unconscious deaths, it doesn't talk about your childhood, it doesn't talk about your dreams. Um, but if someone has a problem, if someone comes, a client comes to a therapist with a problem, uh, and the problem may be a behavioral, that they keep doing something they don't want to do.
do, or it may be emotional. Well, let's take an emotional problem. Um, let's say that their emotional problem is that they're afraid to go out of the apartment. That, uh, they're terrified of being out among people, which sometimes occurs. Now, what Ellis's method is to ask them what thoughts are going through their minds uh, when they have this feeling of terror of being out among people. Uh, and um, this is actually quite a technique because we have these thoughts, which he calls self-statements, which Aaron Beck later called automatic thoughts, uh, and we don't pay any attention to them. Uh, it, and they're not in our unconscious, they're not inaccessible, it's just we have to think about what we're doing in the right way, and then we notice them. Uh, so, he will find that, um, elicit these basic thoughts, and then he will offer ways to replace these thoughts with what he called more rational thoughts. Personally, I, I'm doubtful about this irrational and irrational language, but this, this is the way Ellis, in fact, ra Ellis called his method of therapy, rational therapy, initially. Then after a couple of years, people started interpreting it as being against emotions, so he called it rational emotive therapy. And then, uh, many years later, um, when people um, started taking that to mean that it was all a matter of thoughts and emotions and just passing it, he called it rational emotive behavior therapy, or REBT. And uh, he, Ellis died a few years ago. Uh, and that's an interesting story, uh, but um, some I've noticed that some uh, rational emotive, some followers of Ellis are now calling it rational emotive cognitive behavior therapy. Um, so um, uh, these things develop, but it's, but it's, the, it's just the same basic method. Now, Aaron Beck came along about ten years later than Ellis and borrowed some of Ellis's ideas, but developed some of his own. And Beck was again a psychoanalyst. Now. When, but unlike Ellis, he had a good, prestigious university position, he had commanding resources. Um, and uh, one of the things he did was to try and test some psychoanalytic theories. Uh, and he had this study where he tried to test the psychoanalytic theory of depression. Beck has always been more interested in depression than any other kind of problem. Uh, now, according to Freud, and most psychoanalysts, even, even non-Freudian psychoanalysts, uh, dissident psychoanalysts would accept this, that depression is caused by anger directed inward. So the idea is that you're feeling angry, but you, you repress your anger, and that you turn it against yourself, and that becomes self-destructive, and that causes depression. So Beck thought he would test this by analyzing the dreams. And of course, it's also part of the dogma of psychoanalysis that your dreams tell you what's in your unconscious. Um, so uh, Beck did a, a, a quantitative analysis of the dreams of depressed people, expecting to find that there would be signs of aggression showing this anger which was being repressed and directed against yourself. And of course, we all know what he would find, since there is no truth in this theory that depression is anger directed inwards. What he found was that um, there was somewhat less anger in the dreams of depressed people uh, than in the dreams of non-depressed people. Not, not a big difference, but somewhat less. Uh, and what there was, was a feeling, what came across in the analysis of the dreams was worthlessness and hopelessness. Um, so this, be this began the next process of becoming skeptical about um, psychoanalysis. And, and he followed in Ellis's footsteps uh, but doing it more quantitative, in a more quantitative method. Um, and so he's, he did what all these people have done, and it's a very interesting sociological fact, that all these people who've been successful innovators in psychotherapy set up their own institute with its own bank balance and its own publications. And they say, this is my therapy, and it's different to all the others. Uh, so, um, and so come and patronize my Institute. So Ellis did that, set up the Institute for Rational Living, which eventually became the Albert Ellis Institute. Uh, Beck did it, and he called, but of course he did the trick of uniting the private and the public sectors because he had this control over the psychology department in, in um, Philadelphia. So he was able to uh, do both 
the get, get it out of the taxpayers and out of the clients. Uh, and so he did that. Um, and you notice know, a streak of cynicism sometimes in the things that say. Yeah. Um, uh, but um, he, he developed a theory that was very much like Alice's, uh much more quantitative, much more pre-scheduled. There is a big difference, however, between the Alice therapy and the Beck therapy. They're both the same in that they're both broadly cognitive behavioral therapies, and you should realize by now those are the good guys. Um, uh, the big difference is that in Ellis, the real problems always come from what he called musts, demands, demanding thinking. Whereas uh, the emphasis in Beck is on unrealistic thinking, uh, dis what he called cognitive distortions. So Beck, Beck's therapy is trying to give the client a more accurate view of the world and of their place in it. Uh, Ellis doesn't care really terribly if a client has got some unrealistic views. That's not his concern. Uh, what, but what he does try to do is to teach the client how to get rid of the demanding thinking, the musts. Um, uh, another person I'm going to mention, I'm getting close to the end now, but um, <clears throat> another person I'm going to mention because he's made a big contribution to, uh, to cognitive behavioral therapy is Martin Seligman. Um, and he is, most of the people who've developed psychotherapeutic ideas have not been primarily uh, research scholars in university departments, but Seligman is an exception. Uh, Seligman started out as a behaviorist uh, and did, and did um, experiments which were designed to show once again that animals could learn anything given the right circumstances. And one of the things that happens when you do research and it doesn't quite do what you expect it to do, is you somehow ignore what it's telling you. And this happens again and again in different fields, especially in the behavioral sciences. Uh, so one of the things that he, they, they're doing a routine kind of behaviorist, experiment, typical behaviorist experiment, studying a bunch of dogs and how they would associate a, a sounded tone with an electric shock, a mild electric shock, but, it, but strong enough to be unpleasant. Um, and um, what they found in, when they did this experiment, as, ha as had been found numerous times before in numerous behaviorist experiments with dogs, is that a very high proportion of dogs became totally listless and apathetic and wouldn't respond to anything. Now, uh, what was the response of behaviorists when that happened? Well, the typical response was, oh, damn, the experiment's all screwed up. There's a glitch. Uh, we can't do the experiment. But what Martin Seligman did was he looked at this and he said, it's almost as if these dogs have drawn the conclusion that it's not worth trying to get away from the electric shock. And he developed this theory of learned helplessness, um, which as soon as they started testing it with that in mind, it was abundantly corroborated, and they found it in humans as well. And the interesting thing is some dogs do do this, they do give up easily, some dogs never give up, some dog, dogs give up but can be trained not to give up, and this, this began, so Seligman began to develop ideas of psychotherapy, training people to be not helpless and to be more optimistic, and then of course he found out about Ellis and Beck and started borrowing their ideas. Uh, but, so his most important contribution was this theory of learned optimism that optimistic people are more successful and get what they want more efficiently. Uh, and it's partly because they're seeing the world in a particular way. Uh, that, that, so that's, uh, that's uh, selling. Um, I think I've probably said enough. Do you think so? Yes. Um, <laughs> so. I do. I just want to publicly thank the people next door at the Lincoln Lodge for graciously providing the microphone. Yes, thank you. Yes. Yes. yes, now your questions. I see uh, Ed Rios has a question and also uh, Doug Lashier and... Hi, uh, uh, John. Yes, you. <laughs> Can I start? Uh, well, we'll start with Ed. Okay. 
Okay. <laughs> Well, <clears throat> I could answer that in, in various ways. Whenever I, whenever I say anything like that, it always reminds me of the Monty Python skit. I can answer it in a high-pitched, squeaky voice. Um, no, um, seriously, um, there's a number of things come to mind. First of all, uh, Freud had this idea that the unconscious thinks in a non-rational way, which he called primary process and it's very associative and illogical uh, and, and I think there are problems with this but this is Freud's this is what Freud thought so uh, that a four-year-old girl would discover that her brother has a penis and she doesn't and then conclude that she's been castrated given this primary process is not I was going to say it's not too fantastic. Well, that's exactly what it is, of course. But, but um, it, it makes a certain sense within Freud's theory. Uh, I mean, um, uh, yeah. I mean, the, the, is it any less fantastic that little boys want to kill their fathers? Um, you know, it's um, it's. But once you accept this idea that there are thoughts and feelings and, and motives going on in an unconscious part of your mind uh, then it, and, the, and that they're not subject to logic um, because you see Freud has this idea that little babies hallucinate what they want and it's a way of getting what they want um, and so so logical categories don't necessarily apply and, they, and, and some of the conclusions that um, little girls and boys in their own country, remember this is something they don't know. The little girls don't know that they think this. It's something going on in their unconscious mind. And an interesting point that a lot of people don't understand is that, is that Freud had spelled fantasy two ways, with an F and with a PH. Many translators just translate it all with an F. It's the same in German. Um, and uh, that actually they're two quite different things because of course we all know that a fantasy spelled with an F is a conscious process I mean uh, a fantasy is a thought process and it's perfectly conscious and nothing unconscious about it but, so, but he, when he spells it with a PH uh, then it's an unconscious process that people don't know is going on um, and Freud wasn't con completely consistent in that spelling difference, although some later Freudians like Melanie Klein were completely consistent, uh, and they made a point of it. So th these fantasies in the unconscious of the infant, fantasies with the PH, um, are not very logical. All right, John, John Rachel. I had a two-part question. Uh, first part was, um, you said there's what, 800 different types of therapy or something, or thousands? To me, that sounds crazy. I mean, there seems to be no way to physically measure success in this field. Nobody can agree on anything. Um, how do you resolve something like that? Well, it, 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 to me, it sounds, it, it indicates there is not too much street credibility in any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. you know? Right, and that's a and charging degree. a lot of money for this crap. All this, you know, mm -hmm. so how would you resolve that and make it credible or just dismiss it as a, as a, a well, functional part of society? A lot of research is done into the outcomes of psychotherapy. It's, it's been done all the time, and uh, 
it consistently, the research consistently shows that psychotherapy helps people recover, that it's beneficial. In other words, you know, that someone given psychotherapy gets cured of depression or whatever it is um, more often than someone who's just a, in the control group and doesn't get any psychotherapy. That's consistently shown. There is much more controversy about research into the differential effects of different types of psychotherapy. And there is, um, there is a particular point of view which we, can, we, we combat in the book, but it is, you'll run into it if you start talking about this with different people, which is, which is called psychotherapy equivalence, that all psychotherapy uh, is the same. Uh, and there's a guy called Jerome Frank who, um, who developed this way back and he's just come out, well, a couple of years ago came out with a new edition of his book. Um, it's called, um, let me see what's it called, Healing and... Persuasion and healing. Persuasion and healing, good, yeah. Um, and uh, so he, he's the main fountainhead of this idea of psych psychotherapy equivalence. And what he argues, and, what, and it's got a big following, there's a lot of people who are influenced by this idea, that um, what, re what is really, why is it that psychotherapy seems to help people, according to statistical studies, especially since different types of psychotherapy that have utterly different theories seem to help people. And his answer, and it's very popular, is, and I disagree with it completely, his answer is that uh, psychotherapy works and helps people for reasons that have nothing to do with the theories held by the psychotherapists. They're things like the alliance of trust between the therapist and the client. Uh, giving, the, giving the client a plausible theory, true or false, of what's wrong with them. Things like that, you know, so he, he lists these things and he says that these are, uh, these, this is what uh, causes all psychotherapy to come out the same, right? So, um, so this is a, 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 this is constant ongoing research and one, if you, if you look at what psychotherapists say and write, many, not all, but many psychotherapists are acutely aware of this research. And what you will find again and again now, you'll find evidence-based, that word, evidence-based, uh, used by psychotherapists. And they're trying to get clients on the internet and they'll say, my psychotherapy is evidence-based. Um, uh, and um, so the psychotherapists, I mean, I think the psychotherapists, most of them, they want to believe the truth uh, and they want to believe the theory of psychotherapy that's best and they want to help clients. Um, of course they want to pay their mortgage and stuff even more urgently than they want those things but they still want those things uh, it, 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 so there, there is a tendency of psychotherapy generally to evolve in a certain direction I think uh, by the way I, I, I would give you an argument against the idea that, all, that there is psychotherapy equivalence uh, I don't think there is um, and we, in the book we, we do discuss this um, <clears throat> And uh, we argue that cognitive behavioral therapy is more effective than uh, psychodynamic therapy. But that wasn't your question. So there, but the point is that there is evidence. Now you may say, well, uh, what I, a lot of people say, well, statistics can prove anything. But the kind of research studies they've done into the effects of psychotherapy are very similar to the kinds of effect, uh, studies they've done into the effects of medications. What are you going to do with someone who's terribly depressed? Well. Basically, there's two alternatives, psychotherapy or you give them drugs. Uh, and the, so the same, the same kind of research with the same rigor that shows that drugs make a difference, shows that psychotherapy makes a difference. Um, so, and then, uh, then the other thing of this is this, of course, um, there are findings in psychology research which may seem to have, a, which may be done with no thought of having an effect on psychotherapy, which, um, but which, have to, which cause some psychotherapists to modify their views about different things. And of course, the big, the big event of the 1990s was the Judith Rich Harris revolution, the discovery that if you look carefully at the... Um, I mean, the point had been made earlier that she was the most persuasive person to advocate this. If you look carefully at all the studies which have been done up to that point, purporting to show that parents have a big impact on their children, you find that they're all bogus. 
and that uh, basically people had, people had undercounted the genetic effect. Parent, children are like their parents because they share the same genes, uh, some of the same genes. Um, and um, uh, they're not like their parents because of the way their parents treat them. Uh, and that's pretty solid now. There's been so much work done on that. Um, and uh, that, so if you're, if you're someone who believes that you have some theory of psychotherapy, uh, even though Judith Rich Harris was not interested in psychotherapy and the other people, the, the behavioral geneticists that she was drawing on, they were not particularly interested in psychotherapy either. But if you're a psychotherapist who, who believes that what happened in your childhood, in especially your interaction with your parents, is, has formed your personality, you've got to look at that and say, wow, that's, uh, this is all wrong. I've been believing something totally wrong because the evidence now is that's just not true. Um, and, um, you know, so, so, so there, is, there, there is evidence from actual studies of the effects of psychotherapy, but there is also indirect uh, evidence just from psychology that has a bearing on what you believe might be good for psychotherapy. I have, another part, I have another part of that question, uh, another part. You might have already answered, but I was going to ask you what newest developments really excite you in the field right now. I don't know if you might have answered that already. Well, um, that's a tough one. Uh, I, I, would, I, I, would, I, I can't think of any really recent developments that have greatly excited me. I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm excited by the general prospect that the bad guys, psychodynamic therapists, are declining, and the good guys, uh, the cognitive behavioral therapists, are expanding. Um, I, I don't know that I've seen anything that I thought... The breakthrough that we're talking about in the title of our book, Therapy Breakthrough, is the breakthrough in the mid-50s when Albert Ellis developed what he then called rational therapy. So nothing new in the last six years? Oh, there's been lots of things, but they're pretty minor. Okay. Uh, Doug? Yeah, uh, thank you, Brown. Uh, this is my question. Do you deny that psychotherapy, now in some circles today, they don't use the term psychotherapy, they call it talk therapy, can work for some people, and that a change in the balance of neurotransmitter, which are brain chemicals, can explain radical changes in behavior and personality? No, I don't deny that at all. And, I, and one of the points we make in the book is that drugs can be very useful for a lot of people. Yep. We know we're not against using medication. But you said a little while ago that you either get therapy, psychotherapy, yeah. or the drug. But oh, I both. In, in yeah, I should, I should have said both. both. I should have said both. both. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, look. Um, if you're in a mental it, hospital, you're going to get both. It's, it, it's actually... It, there's certain things in the book that we, are, we try to keep simple. The problem with the, these kinds of questions is the results are different for all different types of disorders um, and different types of um, uh, medications and different types of therapy. So you get a, a complicated thing. But I would say as a broad generalization, um, psychotherapy alone is just as effective for most disorders as medications alone and the relapse rate is lower. Now from the point of view of a busy psychiatrist, uh, it, uh, psychotherapy doesn't look good because you can, you can listen to someone say I'm depressed and it takes two minutes and you can write them out a prescription and you can get, you can get through uh, you know, hundreds of clients in the time it would take for a 12-week uh, a course of psychotherapy with someone. Um, so um, the, it's a, diff a difference between private costs and social costs there, putting my economist hat on. Um, but, but you know, I better... Uh, medications can be great, and uh, we're not, we don't, we don't, um, we're not opposed to them but, at all. But do you know there is a difference between clinical depression and episodic depression? Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, Let's go. Next both next can time. be treated by psychotherapy. Next question. At the beginning of your talk, you said that uh, addiction medicine is psychotherapy. Is there an effective way of treating a drug addiction? Well, I think, I think that, um, oh, let me think. I think that, uh, that, that psychotherapy, cognitive behavioral therapy works for addiction. It doesn't work in every case, but I think it has, it's better than, better than random uh, results. It encourages people to, um, I, you know, I, I, I personally, addiction is something I've thought a lot about independent of this book. And uh, I do accept that, 
maxim that addiction is a choice, uh, not, not a disease. Um, and um, uh, therapy uh, can change people's thinking. There's addictive thinking and non-addictive thinking. Uh, and people can be taught that uh, the must that lies behind it, I must, I mustn't go through the next couple of hours feeling uncomfortable. Uh, those kinds of musts can be dealt with by psychotherapy. Jerry Lovett? Yes, thank you for your presentation. Can you say a few words about your co-author? Uh, I have the two co-authors uh, in this book. And my, 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 the earlier book I did, I should, I should explain, I'm not a psychotherapist, and I've never been involved in psychotherapy either as a client or as a therapist. Uh, and I got involved in this when, in 1997, well, that's when the book appeared. Uh, Michael Edelstein and I, he's a psychotherapist in San Francisco. Uh, <clears throat> together we wrote a book called Three Minute Therapy, which is, um, we tried to, we tried to present Albert Ellis's Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy in the simplest possible way. And I think we succeeded. Simplest for an intelligent reading person. Um, and uh, so that was that book, Three Minute Therapy. Uh, and of course, we, it took some years to write that, so I was actually collaborating with him. But in that, in that case, in that book, 90% of the ideas were his, and I just came up with the way to put them in the most eloquent, persuasive, and simple manner. Uh, <clears throat> Since then, I've spent a lot of time thinking about psychotherapy and talking to him. Uh, and we started writing this book that became Therapy Breakthrough. And then we heard from another psychotherapist who was doing a similar thing, Richard Kuyoff, and we collaborated with him, but he died. Um, so uh, I can say a lot about him, he's dead. Um, but but um, uh, he was a therapist in Illinois. Um, and. Um, like Michael Edelstein and like myself, uh, was inclined to believe in rational emotive behavior therapy. Uh, so Michael Edelstein has still got a practice in San Francisco, uh, flourishing practice, and he writes a column for a local newspaper and does a lot. For, and it, the, the, the title of um, our earlier book, Three Minute Therapy, if you Google that, you'll find all kinds of stuff about uh, three Minute Therapy. It's, it's, three Minute Therapy is one of those books. It never became a bestseller, uh, but it's never been in any danger of going out of print. It's, it's, co it's continuous. We're constantly hearing from people who want to know more, and that's one of the reasons we've decided to write this book, uh, Therapy Break. Uh, Tim Lowell, Could you give us your views on the therapy methods, if there's any, on the following people? Norman Vincent Peale, Napoleon Hill, and Rick Warren. Do they have anything in common, or what would you describe their behavior modification style to be? Um, there's certainly, uh, Norman Vincent Peale and Napoleon Hill, there's a great similarity there. And they are both, very, in many ways, similar to a guy called Emil Cui, who um, uh, was, a, was the prophet of uh, auto-suggestion. In every way, every day, in every way, I'm getting better and better. Uh, and uh, basically, um, I, I, I take my, the view I take of that is commonplace among cognitive behavioral therapists. We don't think much of it. Um, uh, that basically just constantly telling yourself that everything's fine is not going to do it uh, because it's not it's not giving you the tools to cope with things that are not fun. Um, and um, uh, so. Um, if, if you take the Albert Ellis method, it doesn't say um, if someone if someone says uh, it's just terrible that my wife wants to see other men and I can't stand it. Um, you don't say everything's fine. She's not seeing other men, and if she is, it's okay. Uh, what you do is you take that the thinking of that person and you break it down and you say you eventually have them thinking I really don't like the fact that my wife wants to see other men I really wish it was so however reality is what it is uh, and uh, I better accept the fact if that's a fact uh, and it's not going to destroy me I'm strong and resilient enough to survive this uh, and um, 
uh, I'll find someone else. Uh, so, so there, in other words, it's not replacing a, always replacing a negative thought with a positive thought, but replacing one kind of negative, a self-destructive negative thought, with a more constructive negative thought. As a quick follow-up, does Rick Warren advocate a lot of the same thing, or is he a little bit different than the first two? I, I've read a bit of Rick Warren, uh, and I feel the theology keeps intruding, much more so than it does with Joel Osteen, who I, I admire uh -huh. Joel Osteen more than I admire Rick Warren. Uh, but um, I, I, would, I don't know that... Um, it, it's always difficult to tell when there's this religious element there, because the idea that... Yeah. Uh, it's best not to worry too much. Is always bound up with the idea that God's going to look after you, um, which is not something I find at all convincing. Okay. Um, Thanks. Uh, Charles? Yeah, David, over the years there's increasing cognitive dissonance between myself and the people who come to the College of Capitalism. <laughs> Is that a healthy, positive stocking? <laughs> Egomania, I call it. <laughs> but seriously, you <laughs> seem to be played devout religious observance with a form of treatment for mental illness. Uh, are they one and all the same activity? Um, actually, I do have other theories, <laughs> as well as the ones in this book. And one of my theories is, which I hope to eventually write a book about, is that all belief systems have a great similarity. And I don't think that's a bad thing. And I don't think it means that there's no difference, objective difference between the truth and untruth of belief systems. But I think there's great similarities. And in, in, in reading about the Freudian movement, the psychoanalysis, uh, and I've also, in another capacity, read a lot about left-wing groups in the 1930s and 1940s, uh, because I'm writing a book about George Orwell. And um, uh, the, the similarities are amazing. Uh, and the same, and then, you, then you look at some, so there's the psychoanalytic movement, there's uh, political movements, then you look at religious movements, and the similarities are amazing, especially when it comes to splits schisms, um, denunciations of people who've got it wrong, um, that, you know, that what happens when um, the leader of a, of a belief system uh, distrusts someone in, in their entourage, you know, the, 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 the same patterns keep repeating. So, I, you know, this is, this is nothing to do with this book, but it is to do with another book if I live to be 200 and write all the books I want to write, um, uh, is that people say, oh, that's a religion. And I think, no, religion is a belief system. And what you're saying is, that's a belief system. Uh, because, you know, what we think of as being attributes of religious thinking in adherence to a belief system is common to all, including scientific theories and uh, common sense theories. There's a great similarity in, in the pattern of belief in all these different areas. So, I don't, if someone says, oh, you, you, you know, it's a religion that uh, Albert Ellis is the prophet of um, rational emotive behavior therapy, it doesn't bother me at all. I think, no, you don't understand what a religion is. <laughs> you know, uh, all belief systems, whether they're to do with God or not, or to the supernatural or not, have a great similarity. So you mean I've got a commonality with me being a capitalist and Charlie a socialist. Oh. What's that? So there's some commonality between socialism and capitalism after all. Well, um, when, I was, um, when I was in my 20s, I was a Marxist and I was a very active member of the Marxist group. And then later on I became a libertarian and a very active member of libertarian organizations. And I'm constantly struck by the similarities. Okay. Um, and, and, uh, and earlier when I was... Uh, a child, my father suddenly became born again, and uh, I suddenly was listening to all this stuff about how Jesus had saved him, and uh, and I observed all this um, religious stuff, and again I'm struck by the similarity. So all these things, different, op apparently opposite political movements have very great similarities, um, and um, uh, the same with religious movements. David, very good talk, of course. Um, 
you okay. mentioned, uh, discussed rather, the one before Ellis Rogers mm -hmm. as the main character. Are you familiar at all with his protege, Jared DeVille? And do you have any thoughts? No, I, I, I mean, I've heard about him, but I've not read anything to form an opinion. Do you like him? My friend studied him. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I don't know enough about him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you agree with my point that therapy is really a reflection of the norms of the day. I, you'd have to explain what that means exactly. I can say well, about six different right, things that might mean. My analysis had to do with the, the suppression of the woman's psyche. That was his first experiment. So it reflects everything that he writes about, about the uh, inability for women to express what they felt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she told me. So isn't that a reflection? Is, isn't the inability to deal with some of the things yeah. today, the inability to deal what is the wrong? I'm still not clear why you think that um, any particular system of psychotherapy would reflect the norms of society. Yes. Well, the norms of society will express certain needs. Mm -hmm. In this instance, with Freud, the woman that was treated in the beginning had needs of expression of her sexual desire. Today, the norms are very vague. Oh, I see what you mean. Yes. So what you're so what you're saying is that psychoanalysis was a response to a very repressive view of sex. That's right. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, uh, if you if you um, if you watch uh, the Merry Widow or um, uh, Deflate a Mouse, um, you know. I don't get the idea that Viennese society was all that repressed. Uh, it seems to be pretty freewheeling. The sw swinging Vienna, I think. Um, but um, historians will disagree with you. You think so? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, Freud's thoughts of the unconscious, the id, and the super -it. Super ego, yeah. Super ego are very, um, have a strong place in history. Okay? But you mentioned, you, in a, I got through your talk the impression that you didn't believe in this construct of the unconscious, but of course you still use the word unconscious to mean something that isn't thoughtful, that isn't, you know, mm -hmm. but um, do you not believe that Freud's idea of the unconscious as a reality is accurate? Well, look, I think that there's, <clears throat> there are unconscious, there are things going on in your body that you're not aware of, and there are things going on in your brain that you're not aware of. And some of the things going on in your brain that you're not aware of affect how you think and affect how you feel. So if that's the unconscious, I fully accept there is an unconscious. What I don't accept is that the unconscious is a place where stories are told, where events... I don't accept the idea of fantasies with a PH. Uh, I don't accept that... Um, you can have a whole uh, elaborate plot involved in the case of Freud with seducing your mother and killing your father uh, that you know nothing about uh, that's going on in your unconscious. So, you see, I, 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 don't think, I don't think the unconscious is like that. I don't think it's a sort of... I don't think that the unconscious is being... Freud, Freud had the idea that um, the difference between the conscious and the unconscious is that the unconscious is invisible. That the consciousness is like a light that sees into the contents of the mind. And what's lit up by this light is what is conscious and everything else is in darkness. But it's there 
uh, that the light isn't shining on it. I don't think that's correct at all. I don't think that's correct at all. For example, um, if someone asks you out of the blue in a, in a quiz show, let's say, what's the capital of France? You immediately say Paris. Uh, I don't think the idea that Paris is the capital of France existed somewhere in your mind before you were asked that question. I don't think there was an, I don't think it was there like an actor waiting in the wings just for the cue to walk on, right? I, 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 think, I think that what was in your mind was coded information in the physiology of your brain, completely meaningless coded information except that it could be decoded by the right stimulus. Um, an, an example I sometimes use to try to explain this is, if you, if you, if you think of a, a simple pocket calculator, right, you can pick up anywhere for 10 bucks, uh, you put in a, uh, multiply two numbers and you get the answer. Now, if you lived 100 years ago and somebody gave you this, like miraculously from the future, gave you this gizmo, you'd probably, your first assumption would be that this, this was a thing that stored all the answers to all the possible questions. But you and I know, in 2013, that's completely untrue. The answer isn't in there until you input the question. It just isn't in there. Uh, and the mind, I think, is like that. What you're not thinking of is not existing somewhere, unconsciously. What, what exists is a disposition to produce the answer when the stimulus is correct. So this is where I think Freud is totally wrong in his view of the unconscious. Uh, the whole idea of the unconscious as being like an alternative mind, I think, is wrong. But there are unconscious influences, I mean, the, of course. Uh, and there are unconscious influences you don't know anything about. And there are unconscious influences you do know something about. Um, there are unconscious influences you can change and unconscious influences you can't change. All right, David, uh, Travis, you have a question? Oh. All right, okay. One uh, more from me. Let's see. Uh, Anybody else? Yes, uh, John. Mike. I had a question. Uh, uh, female, su female participation in society has been suppressed for most of the planet for a very long time. Is there any branches of therapy to try to analyze that or figure out why that is? Has that ever really been taken up? Uh, I mean, it's not, the, it's not the point of psychotherapy to produce general theories of why things happen. Um, I mean, obviously, many people in the history of psychotherapy have tried to explain this kind of thing. Uh, Freud did. Karen Horn I did. Um, I mean, but basically, therapy is a way of dealing with individuals' problems. And if there is a woman who comes into therapy who feels frustrated because of uh, societies in some way or the yeah. mole rays are in some way limiting her, then that's a problem that can be addressed. Yeah. But so the focus is on individual cases more. Yeah, than. oh, absolutely. Yeah. Would you consider being a Cubs fan a form of gestalt therapy? <laughs> it's about, I would say it's on about the same intellectual level. <laughs> No, I haven't. I, I haven't seen it, but I did. Uh, it, it, we mentioned it in our book as an example of therapy being portrayed in a way that's 60 to 70 years out of date. And I did question a number of people about it, and I was assured by a whole host of different people that it does present psychotherapy as it was 60 years ago, and not as it is today. You know, we're uh, just about. Uh and, uh, rebuttals. I think we should move to the rebuttal period. Uh, how many people have remarks to make to the rest of us? I'm going to repress to the subject. <laughs> okay, one, two, three, four, five, six. Eight. About four minutes. Uh, you just count seven people. Charlie always. We're trying to fill the hour. Yeah, that may alienate him from this entire five minutes. <laughs> Maybe. All of you. Uh, we got uh, your last question. Five minutes. Uh, Charlie, you have a question. Yeah. Uh, I'm 
Uh, after which, uh, Tim will give you a, a signal. Yep. Uh, and and uh, you better end your sentence pretty quickly. I can uh, stick it over um, here. Because uh, you might get trampled by the fuel. Just stand up there. Waiting. Okay, Dan. All right, uh, let's uh, thank our speaker. Hey, speaker. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Timothy. All right. Yeah, let's uh, recognize It was a very interesting speech. He gave a lot of definitions about the different schools of psychotherapy, but uh, he didn't explain certain things. There's two different basic schools. Actually, three. One is a materialist school, which believes in the reflection theory. Now, the reflection theory means that the way you live your life reflects in your brain, and you you act a certain way because of your experience in life itself. And somebody goes to a materialist uh, therapist, what the materialist therapist tries to do is isolate the contradictions in a person's life. And many people have various contradictions. One thing, people are gregarious by nature. And you'll find that people with these type of problems, psychiatric problems, usually are not very gregarious. They keep to themselves to a large degree, and they won't face up to life. Maybe somebody uh, has to make a living, you won't go out and make a living, or uh, you might have trouble some trouble that he's not facing up to and might be going to work or some other problems. There's so many problems in our type of society that people run away from. And when you want to run away from a problem and you don't face up to it, what happens is you get a distortion of reality. And that's what happens, this distortion is the uh, neurosis. And the way uh, materialist therapists would go about is try to isolate what the contradiction is and then go ahead and have the patient face up to the contradiction. And in facing up to the contradiction, he would resolve the problem. Now, you could hit a certain point where the contradictions become so intense, and so many of them, that the person actually can't face up to it. And that's when they get it, uh, this neurosis. Uh, and there's uh, the other school is idealism. And that's what he mostly talked about. That is that you try to solve the problem by a thinking process, or a process of will, or going into your dream, by trying to talk, talk it out, what the problem is, and it will go away. In other words, you don't really face up to the problem, but you just talk about it, more or less like uh, an idea is reflected in another idea, which is not true. Idea is a reflection of reality and your place in reality. There's another school, and it's uh, it's a, me a mechanistic school of materialism, and that's uh, pharmacology. And you go to see the psychiatrist. Or the psychiatrist, what he does is give you medicine. Now I'm not saying that this uh, medicine doesn't help. It does help, 
but at the same time, he doesn't actually try to solve your real problems in life and make you face up to it. And I went with my wife, she has Alzheimer's, to see the psychiatrist and to get medicines, and you see the same people coming back over and over and over again, and they all act the same every time you see them. So it's not really solving the problem. Good evening. Uh, my uh, grandmother said that all psychiatrists need to see a psychiatrist. I'm inclined generally to agree with that. However, I think our speaker gave a good presentation, and uh, but I want to say that he was rather uh, off base with respect to Wilhelm Reich. Uh, Wilhelm Reich believed that the orgasm is a dis... Wilhelm Reich believed that virtually no one was in a perfect state of health, and that a perfect state of health would be indicated by a proper orgasm. And uh, Wilhelm Reich defined a proper orgasm as being something that, uh, that it... Um, uh, comes in waves with greater and greater and greater intensity and then after that uh, slowly uh, falling back to lesser and lesser intensity uh, and uh, that, uh, that uh, the um, proper orgasm was uh, uh, an indication of near perfect health in a person that had a proper orgasm. Incidentally, I always uh, think of that uh, piece of music called Ebb Tide with respect to the proper orgasm. But uh, that's another point. The thing is, is that uh, uh, Wilhelm Wright believed very logically that we are all bombarded by certain particles. I tend to forget the name of those particles that rain down on us all the time and go through us and through virtually everything. And that this takes a toll on our health. And so Wilhelm Reich devised this thing called an organ energy accumulator. <laughs> and in this, it, it really makes good sense. It, uh, he took a, a, a wooden uh, booth and uh, wrapped it with uh, fiberglass. And, uh, well, I'm sorry, put sheet metal over it and then put fiberglass over that and then put steel wool over that and did a number of layers of that. And the idea was that you sat in there and that these things that bombard us all the time are deflected so we don't get hit by as many of it so that uh, our body then has an opportunity to rebuild itself to repair itself and that uh, after sitting in the accumulator for say a half an hour uh, 15 minutes to a half an hour then you um, and you do this at certain intervals that you uh, begin to become more healthy and eventually will uh, experience the uh, proper orgasm uh, which which is an indication of having good health. Uh, that was what uh, Wilhelm Wright believed. I don't uh, believe that our speaker quite uh, made that clear. Thank you very much. I'm Frieda Meyer, and um, I want to tell you a story of we were in um, with Robert Ellis, Albert Ellis, uh, many years ago at McCormick Place. My husband is a marriage counselor, and I was a therapist with uh, behavior disordered teenage girls. And we attended a two-day conference where Albert Ellis was the main speaker. Um, the whole thing, as uh, Dr. Seal said, 
was rational and motive therapy. He felt, too, that uh, you, whatever you spoke, you didn't have to use your emotion. You could get your point across by a rational level. You didn't have to become highly emotional to get your message across. So this was a two-day conference, and um, Kurt said, let's stay downtown. It was a McCormick place, and that way we can be ready in the morning. And I said, no, I want to go home. And he said, why not? Why do you want to go home when we can stay in, you know, right here, not too far? And then, and so anyway, we went the next day. We did go home. We next then went to the next day yeah, to the conference, and Dr. Ellis said, is there anyone here who had a problem? And being vocal like I am, I raised my hand, and he said, well, you come up here. And I came up, and he said, what was your problem? And so I began to tell him what we did that I wanted to go home and my husband wanted to stay here. And he said, well, how did you deal with it? And I said, well, I became very emotional. I said, I'm of Greek descent and I'm very highly emotional when I feel I need to say something, I do. And then my husband, who's being a marriage counselor, his whole thing is that you gotta get your emotions out. So he asked me, what did we do and how we proceeded? And with that, I went on and told him and I became emotional as I was speaking. And he looked at me and he said, you know, that's what's wrong with you goddamn psychologists. You're all fucked up. <laughs> and I just looked at him and I said, Dr. Ellis, why are you getting so emotional? <laughs> and, you know, it was really, I felt very good about it with it and everything. So I do want to thank Dr. Steele. I thought the speech was very, very good. And I just wanted to bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, very good indeed, David. Could hardly have been better. I can't think of any way it could have be been better. And I'll just make a preliminary comment pertinent to Ed's question about the unconscious and then a broader comment about how this all fits after a fashion into intellectual history, or the broader intellectual history. With respect to the unconscious, and I, I suppose I should have asked David if he was familiar at all, he probably is, with the existentialist with Sartre's distinction, not between the unconscious in the sense that David laid it out and the conscious, but Sartre talked about the pre-conscious versus conscious. And his distinction was, look, it's not as if you've got a whole bunch of stuff there that can only be dug out by some sort of, you know, Freudian type who's digging amongst all the possible muck of repression and this and that. Um, Sartre said that, as far as he was concerned, that didn't exist. Um, but you've got you, you've got a bunch of stuff there which could be triggered by mistake or whatever. Am I remembering this right, David? Does that ring a bell with you? Okay, you know. Now, so. Uh, that's a, a different, very different ball game, um, and I, that might be more consistent with some of these more recent folks. I get, but David, had, I'm sure, has way more expertise than I do. Wheel. This is I did this reading 40 years ago. Now, the broader point, however, is what's so striking is whatever theory one might want to come up with as to the milieu of Vienna of late 19th century of Vienna in particular. What's so striking is that such a thing could then explode all over the world and become the rage, evidently just about every place, the way David is, and, and stay the rage for 50 some years, 50 years or so. That's a hell of a thing. And I'm tempted to say a rather tragic thing, and maybe it is that, uh, you know, that, that uh, the fact that it was about sex at all made it racy and got it pressed. And maybe that says more about how ideas spread. You know, if you want to sell something, dress it up in sex or dress it up in bizarre violence or, you know, call for world revolution. Do something dramatic. You're going to get more attention than if you're just doing some sort of boring, rational stuff like the Ellis's and even more boring, the Rogers's of the world. 
And so I'm almost tempted to say that it's, you know, it, what, what, what the old textual historian might sort of need to do more of would be to try to understand and say, think more about how it was, okay, yes, that, that these other things managed to get anywhere at all, given the momentum in the first instance that Freudians have had. Now, granted, of course, that you laid out the, the splits within the movement, and that opened the door to a degree. Use the mic. Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, it, it opened the door to a degree, the splits within um, the Freudian scene opened up the door to a degree, but that these relatively boring ideas um, of, 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 of Ellis and Rogers um, would have finally gotten any place at all is, um, I'm tempted to say, uh, better than I might have dared hope for, given what goes on in in, in human culture generally, you've got you know you, you you've got you, you had a guy like Marx, okay, and he had this grand, overarching theory. It was sort of the the political equivalent of Freudianism in a sense of how overarching of a theory it was, whereby it explained all of history according to certain specific kinds of things. And you know maybe it had something to do with the growth, if that's the word. Of, of, of an intellectual class of, of, of the growth of mass literacy in, in, in 19th century society that, that, that there would be this sort of appeal for these grand overarching theories but I guess I'm struck in particular that it sort of makes sense that some guy like Marx would try to explain all history yeah uh, but then on top of it for someone to try to explain the human unconscious, holy weather, that, that, that strikes me as being grossly ambitious. Okay. Yes, thank you for the introduction, Brown. Um, I just want to make these comments uh, regarding, I, I, I personally have been exposed to mental health uh, recovery. I've been in the hospital. So uh, some of this information I'm going to be sharing with you is from the, my personal knowledge. But uh, one, one of the things that came up and the question was, well, we have all these different theories. You know, why, why, do, why don't we have just one theory? And this is my response to that, that the brain has about 100 billion neurons in it. And it's nourished by brain chemicals called serotonin, dopamine, and there's others. I don't, I can't, couldn't think of the names offhand. And it's because of this variability that uh, uh, treatment that's required in mental dysfunction and illness. It, it, the treatment itself is more of an art uh, than a science because you could have two people that more or less have the same disease or problems, but their uh, brain uh, makeup is going to be different. So you can give one person one drug and it may work <coughs> fine. You give the other person the same drug and it doesn't have any effect. It could be less of an effect, an over effect. You know, the, the, the doctor can only determine, you know, what the proper treatment is is by talking to the person, you know, and then they decide, well, do you increase the uh, dosage or do you reduce it? Do you try another drug? Things like that. And it, it, it's only in conversing uh, that you have this. Now, that usually the the person that controls the drug is the uh, is a psychiatrist. Uh, when I was in the hospital, at re, I was uh, also seeing a psychotherapist, uh, and we, we did talk therapy and talked about what led to my hospitalization. So uh, you know that that's an important thing to keep in mind, and you know and, you know. Each person is going to respond in a different way to the, to the treatment. And so that is a good reason why to have a broad range of uh, treatments to be effective with an individual. I actually had a friend uh, that was on uh, drug therapy with her psychiatrist, but uh, she was still having problems. And it only seemed uh, the psychiatrist was running out of answers, so the only thing he could think of was uh, using electric shock treatment on her. And that seemed to do the trick, but 
you know, that, that's always an option. Uh, you know, it's not like, oh, we've, they used to do it in the past. Maybe they overdid it in the past, but sometimes in modern times and treatment, it has its place. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about is uh, the treatment of addictions to substances. Now, we kind of talked on it a little lightly uh, uh, that, you know, it's, uh, it's something that could be uh, managed, but uh, even that can be very complicated uh, because, you know, you can have try and get a person to have total abstinence, and that may not work. Then I, I've heard of theories where they try to, to, to have a gradual uh, reduction of usage. And uh, a lot of uh, experts in the field of substance abuse have said that alcoholism is a disease, you know. And uh, sometimes, you know, it's, uh, people inherit it or in their brain, brain chemistry or whatever, and it's a problem that way. Uh, the, other, the other thing is, uh, one of the things that all, often happens with uh, substance abuse is that you have mental illness. And they call that dual diagnosis. And there's a, a group uh, that puts out a book called Dual Recovery uh, Anonymous. It's a 12-step program for recovery. And uh, so, you know, that's, that's something that they have uh, in their arsenal for, for dealing uh, with that kind of stuff. Okay, thank you. I will say I found this lecture rather interesting tonight, especially with the way these therapists have come up with a way to separate you from your dollars. I mean, what Jeff was talking about earlier is what marketers have been talking about for years. You know, you find a way to get somebody to feel better, and the next thing you know, oh, it's going to cost you a certain amount of this and a little bit of time. Well. Isn't that kind of what Scientology's doing today? They kind of get you to give you a little bit of a result with their belief system. You want more, so they separate. We'll charge you so much for this, and we'll get you more on this thing. I mean, I can't believe it because I just remember, just fairly recently, I was intrigued by a little ad on the internet, how to pick up women. And sure enough, I clicked on it, and I said, I wonder what this clown's got to say. Well, sure enough, he went on for an hour, before he said it was something as simple as being nice and having a little bit of manners. <laughs> and he wanted you to pay 400 bucks for his course on how to be a proper gentleman. <laughs> Which basically was everything your mother would tell you. Dress nice, be polite, and whatever. Sometimes there's good, sometimes you can find more in the folk wisdom of a crowd or a parent or a good mentor than you can with a good psychotherapy, but I will say this much. It does have a place for some people, and uh, it, it does real good. My form of therapy, I'll be in a place called Springbrook Community Church tomorrow morning at a worship service, much like a lot of the population uses. I find it very beneficial for me, and I find that uh, the belief system that I hold works fairly well for me. I don't want to get into it here because I know some of the people in this crowd are somewhat very anti that belief system but i'm not going to fault you either you guys do what you need that works for you because if there's one thing i know about god he gives you that free choice to accept or reject his beliefs and with that uh you know i think the modern form of psychotherapy could be well applied to uh modern corporations i mean it was in the mid-30s that there was another gentleman that has knew the laws of psychology well. His name was Edward Bernays. He was the founder of modern marketing in a lot of cases. He was the first guy, and I've told this at the college before, to start the smoking trend in the United States. What did he do? He had a bunch of pretty women walk down New York Avenue in the Easter Parade thing, and they were smoking, and they made the world's magazines, and the ideas became popular, and all of a sudden, you've come a long way, baby. What was so funny in Ledward Bernays' later life, when he 
recognized the dangers of what he did. He did a lot of volunteer work for the American Lung Association. <laughs> so on the one hand, but the one thing that uh, really comes out of this whole thing is the art of persuasion and how intermingled the advertising world and the law of psychology and all this stuff is. I tend to call a lot of these professions with have a, what I call a high BS quotient. <laughs> the, along the same way as used car salesmen, congressmen, and uh, perhaps maybe modern politician. If you can't dazzle them with, if you can't dazzle them with brilliance, baffle them with BS. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's why he was successful, wasn't he? No. Uh, David Stills uh, told us that the early uh, psycho, um, psychoanalytic movement uh, was uh, something of a religious sect. And uh, and it's uh, with its excommunications and its uh, followings, its regular rituals and uh, terminology and so on. Well, yes, uh, there is that. But uh, how different Jesus uh, is presented. Uh, to us in the Gospels. Uh, uh, the disciples uh, who went about uh, curing people with uh, unclean spirits and demons and so on, um, but uh, Jesus told them that they should be glad of that their purposes were written in heaven uh, and not so much about how uh, effective they were. Uh, they, most of the people uh, who had presenting difficulties uh, to uh, Jesus and uh, the disciples had you know, the thoughts of inferiority and, and uncleanness uh, of uh, being uh, uh, wicked or dirty and uh, the religion of the day, uh, the uh, Mosaic religion, uh, the religion of the temple, emphasized uh, both uh, the ethical side of uh, life and the uh, appropriate living uh, or what was conceived to be appropriate living for Israelites. Uh, and uh, they weren't prescribing uh, the, this code for everybody but for uh, people who believed in their God, uh, who were members of their people. And, uh, and a good many of the uh, people of his day were not too sure of their belonging to the people or of uh, their obedience uh, to the terms of the covenant. Uh, so uh, there were a lot of self-doubts. Uh, uh, Jesus also emphasized, uh, freely you have received, freely give. Uh, he sent them out in, in pairs, not just as individuals, but uh, in pairs to actually present uh, his teaching, uh, his attitude uh, to the people of uh, Galilee particularly because most of his uh, early disciples were Galileans but they weren't all uh, suitable to present in Judea uh, 
Judas Iscariot and a couple of others uh, were Judeans, uh, but uh, for the most part they were Galileans and they spoke funny, <laughs> uh, according to the uh, Judeans. Uh, well, anyway, uh, I, I think uh, my time has elapsed, and I, uh, but that was the uh, parallels I noticed. All right, let, let's hang our speaker again. I was really very interesting. The, uh, I'm going to be eclectic as usual here. I think we have to make a distinction between uh, theories, he's discussing here essentially theories of treatment, whereas I think of it more so as theories of personality. I always thought the, Don, one fool at a time. Um, but seriously, there's, there's theories of treatment and there's theories of personality, which I'm, my approach to it is from the personality thing. I'm, I'm a union organizer and represent people in grievances and so forth, but I'm, on Monday I'm going to look over the book I have on the psychology of work. Okay. And um, I've often been curious why people would engage in this activity. It seems to me that they, they put up they have a great measure of tolerance. And you mentioned Karen Horney, and from my perspective, I believe she said, a great many, if not all, of our life's activities were to reduce anxieties, or fear of the unknown. And I think that's why people put up with abuse at work in a capitalist system, Dave, which is inherent to capitalism, is this intimidation and fear, <laughs> and fear of unemployment. And people, I, you could say they're acting responsibly, they're providing for their own, uh, but the amount of abuse that individuals take and the threshold, let's say, before they file a grievance, sometimes amazes me. Sometimes they do nothing until they are being fired or they only approach us for assistance. Uh, and they're afraid to say anything or do anything that would upset authorities. Um, I don't know if you have one of the, that, seriously, is there a treatment for this? Maybe it's joining a union. I've never had that uh, intimidation myself. I'm, I'm kind of the guy who likes to say the emperor has no clothes, which some may regard as recklessness, but I don't know. Um, I don't, regarding my parents, I really never paid much attention to what they were up to. So I don't know if the child was the father of the man or some other parts of my anatomy had anything to do with it. I <laughs> did things on my own. Uh, I was, maybe you could look in the book of yours, perhaps you can give me a theory as to why people come to the College of Complex <laughs> to the extent that they do, and yet they have a certain measure of loyalty to this. And many people, it's, it's once or twice, but my God, this goes on for years. I've never really understood that personally. I mean, as many years as I've come here. Same reason. Regarding, regarding this religion, uh, it, this is rather intriguing. Uh, we have to be, I, I guess some people have unclean spirits. <laughs> I'm going to use that. My boss has unclean spirits. Uh, no, uh, is church and religion is personal therapy. I, you know. Uh, it's a package belief system. Unfortunately, I'd be careful though. You're creating your own world. And is that a realistic world that you're creating or, or occupying, I guess? Yeah, you know, and then you say, well, it's faith and things like this. Getting back to the world of work, I think that's what came up here talking about the dogs and, and three uh, uh, things like that. But, um, yeah, that was pretty interesting. Regarding three minute therapy, I also was thinking I, to get copies for these guys, 
but it's going to take, it, it's going to be like three year therapy. <laughs> <laughs> Just practice there. Three minutes, nothing. This one wouldn't have any effect whatsoever. <laughs> Anyhow, thank you so very much. It was very interesting. been around here about 40 years ago, which makes oh. me just past 35, I mean, right? Uh, I am absolutely thrilled to see all these objections, which is really the mainstay of the College of Complexes. You listen to a speaker and you object to this. <laughs> I object to the speaker. I. There's a very well-known psychologist today, Barry Schwartz, and he teaches in Harvard, and he has a book out which reflects on the fact that we have too many choices. And when people have too many choices, they have a hard time figuring out how to live. In the 60s, with all the cultural revolt that happened there, and the formation of the, what we call the I generation, where, where the I is really the predominant guide of our living, rather than maybe religion or some other doctrine that we can engage in. Where the I forms the reality, where women say, I don't need a marriage. I can raise the child by myself, even the male child. And I disagree here with the speaker. I learned a lot from my father. He was a miserable human being. And I learned not to be miserable. <laughs> this is also, maybe in a negative way, a learning situation. But to my great surprise, the television show that I watch mostly today is Oprah on their uh -huh. own network who has therapy sessions that she gives to mother who cannot handle their male offspring. Somehow, underneath all that, there's the question, maybe we do need a father, do we? I'll leave you with that question. Empty mic. We need another speaker up there unless we want to close out early tonight. Okay. Who else? Anybody else? Linda wants to talk. Go ahead. Got five minutes. Well, you're talking about recent ideas and how to treat all of humanity when you're talking about neurosis, I think. And there's there's a fairly new disease in the American, what is it, the, the list of all the possible psychological diseases. It's called the dysthymic disorder. And it's a little bit of neurosis. It's a little bit of like, I can't achieve my potential in life because of aches and pains. It's a little depression. Um, and it's pretty much all of us, you know. Yeah. But what I wanted to say was that I just finished a book called My Month of Madness by Susan Callahan. She was a successful young journalist for the Washington Post. And she noticed two bug bites on her arm. And a man sneezed on her. Uh, while she was taking public transportation. And then one half of her body and face went numb. And she was sent, oh, then she had a seizure. She was sent to an epilepsy ward. 
and then they sent her to the psychiatry ward and then she was sent to a neurologist and he decided he couldn't treat her successfully so he called in a super neurologist kind of like Dr. House on television and he believed that she had a type of encephalitis and she had a brain biopsy which confirmed that she did and she was treated with well actually it was it was encephalitis caused by an autoimmune disease where her body was eating her brain actually and she was treated with intravenous gamma globulin treatments and um, it was very rare in that it's only been a handful of years since this malady has been known. I think 200 people in all of the United States have been confirmed with this. And she was the only one at the hospital she was at who had ever been diagnosed with this. But the neurologist who is really working on this believes it may possibly be the cause of um, many types of schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, depression, autism. It's got to be caught really early and otherwise it becomes untreatable. At times in her worst state she was like something out of the exorcist in a real state of psychosis. And so I guess my point is that all these therapies are wonderful because even if we're not among the privileged um, who can afford therapy, you know, maybe, maybe we are the privileged and our insurance happens to provide coverage and then we can learn something by whatever process of therapy we're in and then maybe help other people. But I guess my point is maybe the important thing now is like, medical diagnosis for possibilities of cases where people might have been not correctly diagnosed and they wind up wind up in an you know an institution for the rest of their life because this type of thing I was talking about was not caught and treated so it's just like a new breakthrough but therapy is great I love therapy <laughs> Rebuttal, a rebuttal. Speaker gets the last word. <laughs> yes, well, thank you very much. Um, actually, I don't think anybody was rebutting me. Uh -huh. and, uh, so I, I can't defend myself against rebuttals that never happen. Um, I, can just make, I can just make a few comments uh, on things people said. Um, this, this is the, one of the early ones, maybe the first was... Um, that uh, the materialist and idealist um, therapy. This is when I was a Marxist. This is what we used to call vulgar Marxism, uh, by which materialism is that the ideas are simply reflections of the world in the human brain, and they can be accurate or they can be distorted. I don't think that's a correct account of how the human mind works. I think that we have to construct theories about the world. Our theories may be approximately true um, and if, if they, we find that they're inadequate we can scrap them and replace them with somewhat better theories um, so I don't think I don't think that materialism versus idealism is at all useful here um, <coughs> Wilhelm Reich I don't, I don't um, think I disagreed much with what was said as a report of what he held and I don't think it contradicted what I said I mean, of course, I don't believe in the theory of the orgone, uh, and I think maybe the person who made that rebuttal did um, did believe in it. Uh, but um, I, I mean, I think it, it makes perfect sense to me that someone could have a great orgasm if they were seriously ill. I don't think orgasm is the only um, index of health uh, that uh, that is possible. Um, and I also 
I'm a bit uh, suspicious of this whole idea, Reichian idea of the character armor. Um, I don't, I'm not sure that um, people prevent themselves having great orgasms because of their because they hold their muscles too tightly, which was um, which was the the suggestion. Now, the, the idea of the pre-conscious, of course, this was a Freudian idea that. Um, Freud thought there was a pre-conscious and unconscious, or the pre-conscious was a part of the unconscious that was easily retrievable. Um, and it, I think it's interesting that Freud, <coughs> Freud was a great persuader. And um, he is good at uh, putting one over. And I think this is, this is an example because the pre-conscious is, according to Freud, is what you can, you don't, it's not in, <laughs> my voice is giving out, it's not in your consciousness, but you can easily retrieve it, like what you had for breakfast yesterday. That's, that's uh, um, the date of the Battle of Hastings. That's what he means by the pre-conscious. Uh, and of course, <clears throat> there are things you can retrieve easily, there are things you've forgotten. Um, the, the, where Freud makes his innovations is in saying that the things you've forgotten are that really there. Um, yeah, it's, it's not lack of fluid, it's just uh, I've been drinking Coca-Cola for the past half hour. It's, um, <clears throat> so, um, he uses this idea of the pre-conscious to get to the unconscious, but really it, it doesn't get you to the unconscious in the, in the Freudian sense. Um, Sartre is an interesting case because he was very anti-Freud and uh, a lot of people talk about uh, Jean-Paul Sartre and his being a nothingness and they ignore completely the fact that he contains a pretty um, detailed critique of Freud and Freud's notion of the unconscious. Um, now, the, the, the remark about Vienna, psychoanalysis starting in Vienna and then exploding all over the world this, um, and why did this happen? I mean, this is uh, this is fascinating to me. Uh, I'm fascinated by how belief systems catch hold. Um, and I would say that, that uh, psychoanalysis is very much like mesmerism, um, which which uh, existed in came came into being in the late 18th century. And although mesmer was uh, Austrian, he, his main success was in France. In fact. I was surprised to find that the main thing that French intellectuals were talking about before the revolution was not the starving peasants and not um, Rousseau, uh, but mesmerism. This was the big, this was the big uh, uh, thing that, um, and then mesmerism was discredited, but it came back as hypnosis, and there was a big uh, fad for hypnosis, and so you got. Um, the end of the 19th century, you've got uh, novels like Trilby um, with the character Svengali, uh, and it's all working out the implications of hypnosis, but that died down. But hypnosis leads right on to psychoanalysis because when Freud and Breuer were developing their theories, they were reacting somewhat against the discredited ideas of hypnosis. And hypnosis by that time had become uh, like a stage act that nobody really, like Yuri Geller's spoon bending, nobody really believed it anymore. But so Freud, inst Freud instead came up with this idea of free association. Um, and um, so you've got, uh, you've got psychoanalysis developing. Now I think you have to say there must have been some kind of demand for psychotherapy, uh, for, for, um, for psychoanalysis to be so, so successful so quickly and to spread throughout the world so rapidly. Although it, it was much more successful in the United States than it was in the German-speaking world. Um, and uh, of course then Hitler had something to do with it, the rise of Hitler and a lot of the um, psych psychoanalysts became refugees and they came to Britain and the United States and they helped to um, develop psychoanalysis there. Uh, it's interesting to trace some of these things in movies. There's a movie called Carefree with Fred Astaire, which I think is a great movie about psychoanalysis. Uh, it's well worth well worth watching and think of it carefully about. It's all about psychoanalysis. Um, but um, uh, it's a friend of Stare and Ginger Rogers, um, and uh, she pretends to have 
uh, weird psychotic dreams in order to get him interested. Um, and uh, I think one of the, one of the uh, strange things about that is that the idea that there are people who are capable of telling the difference between a dream that anybody might have and a weird psychotic dream. Because there is no difference. <laughs> so um, so um, there, are, there are no such experts. Um, and uh, Spellbound, of course, is the, is, the, is the great triumph of propaganda for psychoanalysis. Um, uh, the movie Spell, uh, Alfred Hitchcock movie Spellbound. Alfred Hitchcock believed in Freud, as many artists, uh, artistic people did at the time. Um, Spellbound is uh, is classic piece of, Fro of Freudian propaganda. It, it's all wall-to-wall uh, -wall psychoanalysis, except that, and this is the interesting thing, that um, the guilty secret that the main character has is that he was involved in the death of his brother. Uh, well, of course, a psychoanal psychoanalyst will tell you that's a screen memory that is covering up the real memory that he wanted to screw his mother. Um, and, um, uh, and of course they couldn't, they couldn't explain that in those days in Hollywood nowadays, nowadays they couldn't get away with not explaining it but in those days they couldn't explain it so for the sake of public decency they had to leave it that he was guilty about killing his brother um, so um, addiction I mean I, I don't have a lot to say about addiction except that I think that the cold turkey method and the tapering method both are both suitable for different kinds of people. Some people, uh, some people, it's beneficial to say no, I'm not going to touch a drop anymore. Whereas other people, it's better to taper. And actually, tapering can be more effective than you might think. It's one of the surprising things about tapering: is monitor, you monitor your consumption of whatever it is. Let's say cigarettes. You're trying to give up cigarettes. You keep a keep a diary of every single cigarette you smoke. And what you generally find is merely monitoring reduces consumption. The mere, mere, the mere fact that you have to write down that you're about to have another cigarette makes some people say, oh, I don't really need to. I've got to write it down, so I won't. And so, um, uh, personally, I'm a taperer. I don't, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not in for a cold turkey about anything. Um, uh, <clears throat> You know, the cynical view that everybody's in it to make money, I think we should always remember that um, everybody uh, in any profession is very influenced by the fact they have to make a living at that profession. Um, and um, it doesn't mean the profession, I mean, you know, you could take this to the absurd lengths that um, George Bernard Shaw did. You would say that all doctors are frauds because they want as much illness as possible, otherwise they'd be out of work. Uh, <coughs> Uh, someone in the fire brigade is just pl is just um, preying on human misery because they want there to be as many fires as possible. But um, psychotherapists are also compassionate people, or some of them are, and um, they want to do good uh, if they can, and if that's compatible with making a living. Um, <clears throat> Jesus as a psychotherapist, I don't know that. Um, <laughs> I don't know that. Uh, I mean, I can make you. I can make your evil spirits go into that herd of pigs over there. Uh, I don't. I'm not sure that that uh, is, is a practical method for most people. Um, so uh, I'm not sure. I mean, I mean, there's a lot of obsessional kind of uh, unfortunate, faulty thinking in Jesus. You know, like going on about how. Nice it is that people are being tortured in hell, that sort of thing is, is, is not uh, inspiring, I don't think. Um, joining a union as treatment, um, that strikes me as just the same as Jesus. Um, uh, I, think <laughs> I mean, I think if you're, un if you're unhappy in a job, I mean, basically, uh, you can always leave that job and get a different job. Um, and, um, uh, I mean, if you think it will get you somewhere to complain, then by all means complain. But forming a union, I, I mean, I, it does strike me as strange that um, this is just an observation, uh, and, and I don't have any particular axe to grind, but why do people keep up these strikes for years that are not going anywhere? Like where, near where I live, I live in Printers Row, and near where I live there's a hotel, and it's picketed every night. 
And the pickets come at 5 o'clock or 5.30 every night and they walk around with these banners. And they've been doing it for years. And the hotel, everybody, it's the Hilton Hotel. Everybody ignores them. Um, and um, uh, somebody is paying out a lot for them. To, they're paid to go there and do this. Uh, this can't be efficient. This can't be, you know, um, for that kind of money uh, that, that's being spent, you'd think they could find a way to c compensate the um, union members for the whatever happened to them at that hotel. It, it, it just strikes me that, that what you've got here is an ideological obsession and not, it's not self-interest. And I'm not against people being unself-interested, it just, but it just strikes me as strange in cases like this. Uh, wage bargaining is all about self-interest, so why introduce this element of self-sacrifice into it? It doesn't make much sense. Um, <clears throat> somebody said they'd learn from the, the father was miserable, and they learned from, they disagreed with me because they learned from the father how to, how to not be miserable in reaction against the father. Um, I, think, I think that um, the idea that we are tremendously influenced by things our parents do is a very powerful fallacy. And I think that, um, that what happens is that, that uh, some of the things that we are genetically prone to do in our personalities we, would have happened by accident anyway. But when it, and of course, we, if we live with our parents, uh, some of the things, the accident that is going to precipitate some development in our personality is going to come from our parents, but it could just as well have come from somewhere else. So I don't think, what I'm saying is anecdotes don't refute the idea that parents really don't have any influence on their children. Of course, they have a great influence up to conception because they choose the genes that the children have, but after that, parents don't have a great deal of influence on their children. That's one of the big um, disastrous assumptions that Freud bequeathed to the world was that uh, we're victims of our childhood. So, Tell us about your book and where we can find out more about you on the web. Oh, okay, hang on. Um, he doesn't believe in joining a union. It's <laughs> Before you go, we have to have you make your plug. Is it printed by a union? <laughs> I'm scared. Children. Okay. Children tell us about your book and tell us this, where we can find you on the, the web. The first book that I wrote on psychotherapy with Michael Edelstein uh, is this book, Three Minute Therapy. And that was in 1997 that we came out with this. And it's a very simple explanation, very elegant and well written because I wrote it. Um, <laughs> very simple and economical, uh, as simple as we could make it. Um, uh, about, about uh, rational emotive behavioral therapy and just explaining it simply. Um, and we had all kinds of feedback from this book. And the book's still selling in, in fact, it recently became an e-book and it started selling in, even bigger because it's an e-book. Can they find it on Amazon.com? Yeah, yeah, it's on Amazon. Um, it's the worst cover of any book ever, ever published in the history of publishing. Um, but uh, that we have no control over that. Cover, terrible cover. Do you have a website or anything? You, that you look up Three Minute Therapy. On, he's, he's got a website. Uh, Michael Edelstein has a uh, Three Minute Therapy. And do you have an email we can get in touch with you with? Three, three Minute Therapy. Just input that and you'll find all sorts of contacts. So. Okay, and then your now, new the, book? The new, the new book is this. This is the, uh, this is the first page proofs of my new book uh, with Edelstein and Kuyoff, although Kuyoff is not with us anymore. Burn it, burn it. Hmm? Uh, the book is called Therapy Breakthrough. Uh, the subtitle, Why Some Psychotherapies Work Better Than Others. Um, and, um, it, it, uh, is that written for the layman? Uh, what's that? It, that book is it written for the, the average reader? It's, it's certainly written so as to be comprehensible by somebody who know, has no previous knowledge of uh, psychotherapy, psychology, or anything like that. On the other hand, it, it, it's more um, <coughs> philosophical than this book. And, so, it, and, and it goes in, and it's more argumentative. And it goes into explaining why other kinds When's of the book scheduled for publication? Uh, the, the official publication date is September, which means it's going to ship from the printer in August. Okay. Let's thank our speaker one more time. Yeah. All right, thank you.